the way to do that. Carl and Rebecca, and if you could help the. I think you do the share around. screen. Yeah. No, no, they don't have to do it today because there's only one or two comments. Start of the meeting before, because we still have two minutes. Uh, for all of you looking at your screen, there is a toolbar going across the bottom of the, uh, you should see the PowerPoint slide. And down at the bottom, if you want to move your mouse, you should see a toolbar that will have uh, a bunch of options on there being uh, mute, uh, I don't have it on me, mute, video, participants, share, poll, etc. cetera. So uh, if you do have a dog, <laughs> you can mute yourself, which is great. <laughs> So um, Rebecca, I don't see that. Like to talk a lot. <laughs> I don't see the toolbar. I'm using a tablet. Is that, uh, yeah, you don't see the toolbar. Pull your arrow down. It should show up. You may have to touch the screen. I haven't gotten to use the tablet, unfortunately. Yeah, if you pull your arrow down, it, it does pop up on mine. Does pop up on mine. I, I did this, we've been on Zoom several times and I do get that toolbar, but I don't see it here. Well, there is a difference for some of the meetings as uh, this is actually using Zoom webinar versus Zoom meeting. Ah. Mm -hmm. There is a slight difference in the security settings as well as uh, the visual settings. Uh, for example, when you, uh, when you do see the participants list, there is actually, or the participants button that's in that toolbar, uh, you'll be able to pull up what's called the participants list. Yep. And at the bottom of that, you could see all the people who are panelists, which are yourselves uh, here on video, and the attendees who are people in our audience. Actually, I got it. Oh, good. It appears at the top of my screen though. Oh, lucky. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it is 9.30. Should we go ahead and begin? Are we prepared? Yes, so. All right, it's 9.30. I'm calling this meeting to order. Um, Ms. Schultz, can you do a roll call? Yes, I can. Uh, Chair Kaleka? Here. Frank Ordis? He He's won't excused. be a he did send the excuse. Yes. Uh, uh, Patricia Good. Here. Thank you. Richard Blattner. Here. Thank you. Stephen Furr. Not yet. Okay. Sandy Johnson. Here. Thank you. Uh, Greg Stewart. Here, obviously. <laughs> Alan Gabriel. Here. Mike Ronskovitz. Here. Should I go through all the rest of them or do we just nope. need the rest? We're good. Yeah. We're good. So we now have at time certain the whole night conference call. Okay. So Lori, are you ready to go? Hi, hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Is Lisa on? Uh, Not yet. Okay. Lisa's okay. on as a panelist. Rebecca's going to upgrade her now. And there she is. Lisa, you just have to come off of mute. Okay. Good morning. Um, Lisa and I um, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what's going on in DC. I thought we'd start off with how Congress has been handling um, COVID. A few weeks, as you know, I think we have not just uh, spoken since, unfortunately, the pandemic has um, occurred. Congress passed um, the CARES Act about four or five weeks ago, and this was the legislation where a lot of money was given out to municipalities, states, um, in the form of grants and um, funding for housing, community development, hospitals, testing. I'm sure many of you, since you all work with per municipalities, are aware that now the coronavirus relief fund that was given out to lo um, localities and states. But unfortunately, the municipalities had to be of a population of at least 50,000. Excuse me, no, at least 500,000. 
<laughs> and um, we have been lobbying um, very aggressively with the Florida delegation and with Congress to make sure that population threshold is lowered because as you know, only one city in Florida was able to access that money. It looks like um, that the House Democrats are definitely um, going to support increased money for this fund. Um, Speaker Pelosi is talking about um, almost a trillion dollars for the coronavirus relief fund, and that um, funding would be given out to municipalities um, below 500000 Lisa, did you want to go through more of the details of this program that you've heard? No, I, I mean, I think you covered it all. Okay. Uh, what Congress is now considering, um, the Senate came in on Monday. This week, they've focused on dealing with um, judicial nominations and also several nominations for the administration. The House has not yet returned. They are doing a wait and see right now. Um, uh, Hoyer, who's part of the Democratic leadership, has said they will return to consider the next COVID bill whenever that will be. Um, they be, they be calling this next bill CARES Part 2. Um, the Speaker it, Pelosi is supposed to unveil her draft next week. And what we're hearing is it'll be more money for the programs that were allocated in the first CARES Act. So more money for municipalities, like I just went over, more money for housing, more money for community health centers, and probably more money for that PPP program at SBA. Um, I know we're hearing about a possible stimulus bill, more money for infrastructure. Um, what we're hearing is they're not going to put this on this next CARES Part 2 bill, but there's definitely interest um, from House and Senate Democrats and the president to put more money into an infrastructure stimulus bill for transportation and water. Um, but we're thinking that that's going to happen maybe later this summer. And we're working with Paul and Greg to make sure that the right pro formula programs um, are going to receive the are going to receive good funding to make sure um, it meets your priorities. Lisa, what am I missing? Um, I would just say that um, obviously every day is is a new day. It's very remains kind of a fluid situation in Washington, um, just based on you know, the politics that are happening between House leadership and Senate and the administration. And so, you know, the Senate is in session this week. They're working on um, judicial nominations that they have pending. They have held some hearings. Um, they, heard, they held the nomination hearing for uh, the next director of national intelligence, BNI. Um, and the House has made it clear that they're just not going to come back to Washington until they have that CARES 2.0 package um, ready to share with folks. Um, and, you know, we'll, they'll take it from there. Okay, are there any questions from the membership? Yeah, I, have I have a question. Yes, sure. Uh, yes, with with all the money that's been given out for stimulus, do you think that what what impact do you think that's going to have on funding for the kinds of projects that MPOs are interested in? Do you mean the money that's been from the previous stimulus bills, like examples of what has happened in the past? No, what I'm referring to is kind of looking ahead, and I think all of us on the board representing municipalities are doing some contingency planning because we know our revenue sources for the balance of the year are going to be diminished. Uh, and we'll, so we'll have to make adjustments. And I'm, I'm asking the question that if Congress has allocated, and you know, I'm making this up, $5 billion for infrastructure, given the stimulus and the change in the budget, do you see any reduction in those uh, already approved allocations? So I, I think we can answer this by talking about the um, highway trust fund and the gas tax and how they've been backfilling that. I think yeah. that all works together. I, I Go ahead, Lori. I was gonna say, I think the way they're thinking about it, remember ARA back in 2009, the stimulus yes. bill that the Obama administration did? I'm not saying that the next stimulus bill is gonna be, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's great. 
Okay, we're not saying that the next bill is going to be like that, but if they do do an infrastructure bill, they're going to put more money into the formula programs that the MPO already benefits from through federal highways and through federal transit administration. Does that answer your question? Yes, it, it does. Okay. Yeah. I, I would say, I mean, the the projects that you probably have, you know, ready in your 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 tip um, that are, you know, for, far along enough in planning that the, those are going to be the projects that, you know, could be funded when there is an infrastructure bill that would be coming down, you know, the pipeline. Uh, this is this is Ron Klein. I just want to add a, a couple points. Um, can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, just to go along in the uh, uh, earlier stage of the description, um, there is a lot of back and forth right now, as Lisa and Lori said. Uh, the president's pushing for a payroll tax uh, issue that's part of it. I think it's been sort of turned down by the Democrats and some Republicans, but that's still in the mix. The liability protection piece of this thing, which um, Republicans are pushing to, uh, in exchange for money for cities and states. Uh, and I don't know, uh, that's just part of the mix as well. That relates to uh, businesses that open to make sure they have some type of shield if they get sued. So there's a lot of issues other than money issues that are going into this as well this time. Up until this point, it's all been money. Um, I think it's very clear on all sides in Washington that the local governments and businesses are, are, are still and will be hurting for a long time, particularly at the government level, um, you know, with, with lower cash coming in and uh, expenses up, that's, that's a big issue. And I think it it's continues. And I think they'll do something, as Lisa and Lori said. I, I also agree on the uh, public trend, on the infrastructure issue. It's being pushed out farther. Um, I, I don't know necessarily whether it's going to be done in the form of just plugging in money into the uh, existing pots. Uh, you know, there's always the, uh, if it's about job creation, which is the part that's the next stage of recovery, in addition to just, you know, keeping the, keeping the economy afloat or keeping people with money in their pocket to spend, the next piece of this thing is how do you get people back to work? And part of that relates to opening the economy, but I think we all understand that even if the government says, sure, everything can open, that not necessarily people are going to start showing up, spending money, and that is a big uh, impact on whether or not uh, the economy will start really chugging along or how much time it will take to get that going, which all translates into expenses at the government levels and all that stuff. But as far as infrastructure, I really do think it is about the job creation part, which is why Everything right now is about just plugging holes and keeping things afloat, but uh, infrastructure is, is, is on the table. And I would suggest that to the extent we have specific things in mind, uh, we know that the both Democrat and Republican leaders in the House and the Senate are saying to their members, tell us what you think is important to your community. Tell us what you think should be in these next bills. I mean, I've seen letters from Pelosi uh, and uh, McCarthy, and so they're, they're asking for those questions. So. I think to the extent we want to formulate something specific, I don't mean specific as down to the nitty gritty, but I mean things that are important to us as uh, interest in transportation, we should put something together, communicate it to our members uh, that are listening to us, uh, both in the Senate and the House, and just you know be at the table as, as these conversations will develop. Hey, are there any other questions? Okay, I don't see anybody uh, speaking. So thank you very much, our federal advocates. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Stay well. Okay, uh, next is an item of business. Uh, Ms. Schultz, I think I'm gonna need you to make me a host so I can see if anybody's raising their hand since we're about to vote. Uh, I did. Okay, great. Uh, so, next item is the approval of the minutes for March 5th. Um, I do have one small amendment that I wish to make. Under my comments um, regarding the makeup of the board, it, it has a standalone sentence that says that I am not in favor of having the whole county commission on the MPO. I am in favor of having the whole county commission on the M MPO. It was supposed to have a comma with without municipal alternates.
Okay, so if I could get a motion and a second uh, to approve the minutes as amended. Brian, hey Brian. Yes, sir, Mr. Fur. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, first of all, the very un I have a correction as well. At the very first part, it talks about um, uh, desire for my the, the, what I thought was the, the reason for the delay in the approval is related to the desire for designation of alternative alternate county commissioners who may vote. What I what what I had said was that the actual delay was county commission commission was concerned with non county commissioners being substituted as county commissioners. I do remember that is accurate, yes. So we have um, two minor okay, So if that could be, yeah, I just lost you. Okay. Are you oh, there? I, yeah, I can see you on the screen. Oh, I lost the whole picture. Come back, there you go, okay. Okay, yeah, yes, yeah, so with that um, uh, amendment, I'll, I'll make the motion to approve. Well, there's two amendments just for clarity. Oh, yeah, with both with both amendments. Yes. Okay, it's been moved. I, I'll second it, Patty Good. All right, so it's been moved and second. So what we're going to try to do is do by unanimous consent. Uh, so if there is anybody objecting to the motion to approve the minutes with two amendments, uh, please object now. Seeing none, that has been approved by unanimous consent. We now have approval of the agenda. If I can get a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Okay, Mr. Second Blackman. Second Patty Good. Second by Good. Um, we can now do uh, approval by unanimous consent if there is nobody to object. If, if you object, please object now. All right, seeing none, it's approved by unanimous consent. We move on to public comment. Ms. Schultz, did anybody submit any comments? There was no comment submitted. Okay, is there anybody that is on this meeting at this time that would like to make a public comment? Just a question, Brian. How would the public know that they could make comments? It was posted on our agenda uh, with the directions stating, please submit in, uh, please submit public comment to info at browardmpo.org at least 24 hours prior to the start of the meeting. Thank you. Yes, there was a hyperlink. Anybody from the public, would you like to comment? Please do so now. Seeing none, public comments are closed. Uh, we're now going to go as the evaluation committee. Uh, we have the first action item which is discussion and motion regarding general counsel's annual evaluation ratings. Who's gonna lead this up? Um, I guess I can do that if, if you'd like. Uh, sure. bas basically, um, you know, we had sent out to the uh, board members, uh, and Alan's form is a little bit more simple than, than, than what I use. Um, it's either satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Your combined, uh, we actually have an attachment, which is uh, the combined responses for the general counsel. Uh, Mr. Kaleka, Chair Kaleka, you said satisfactory and provided comments. Uh, Vice Chair uh, Frank Gordix uh, said great. Uh, Deputy Vice Chair said patent satisfactory. Um, we have uh, Commissioner Blattner, who uh, also said satisfactory and provided additional comments. Uh, given the environment that we're in, uh, Alan's really stepped up quite a bit in helping all of our team members uh, deal with the virtual experience. Uh, Commissioner Fur, satisfactory. I appreciated the additional work that Alan's been doing uh, regarding surtax, which he's been doing a lot. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, same thing, you know, satisfactory and then provided, you know, very good comments as far as, uh, you know, where, where he's at. So of that, the, so there's six current members to the executive committee. Those six members provided satisfactory response. And with that, uh, you know, the recommendation would be to forward this to the full board for approval 
And congratulations, Alan. You know, if this passes, <laughs> then you get to go to the full board and you and I might be able to serve another year together. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. I just want to, uh, before uh, any further conversation, uh, thank everyone for uh, giving me the opportunity to continue uh, with the uh, Broward MPO. It, it is always a challenge and always uh, interesting um, issues that pop up that are outside of what would typically be uh, governmental uh, law or representation. So thank you. Okay. Does uh, anybody from the membership wish to speak about the evaluations of uh, Mr. Gabriel? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. I kind of lowered it so you wouldn't hear my dog snoring. So, <laughs> so it's, it's the Frenchie. <laughs> yeah, sorry, so it's Better not me. You snoring. <laughs> <laughs> so can uh, someone just remind me, um, does compensation for Mr. Gabriel change depending on his evaluation or does his compensation remain the same? Um, and Mike, I don't know if you want to get into this as well, but basically there is compensation for the firm um, and it is based on the contract that's in place and it's, uh, it's increased based on CPI. Correct. Right. So as long as he gets uh, a satisfactory evaluation, it'll be adjusted based on CPI. Correct. And that's in the contract. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else that has a question? Okay, if not, I'll take a motion and a second to send this to the full board. So moved. Mr. Blattner moved it. Is there a second? I'll second it, Patty Good. Mrs. Good uh, seconded it. Uh, we're now gonna go for unanimous consent. If you object to uh, this, please object at this time. Seeing none, it has been approved and moved to the full board. Now we have uh, the executive director's evaluation. Alan, do you want to take a lead on that or would you like Mike to take the lead on that? I mean, uh, I can do it. But... I, I suggest that Mike do that. All right. Mike, do you have everything in front of you? Yeah, I have it from what I guess what Rebecca has up on the screen here. So yeah. okay. uh, we can go over. This is uh, the evaluation that we have for the past several years uh, for the executive director. He did submit uh, his uh, achievements over the past year. Um, that's part of the uh, agenda item. Um, there are, I believe there are eight criteria. And what you see here is the listed, this was sent out a couple of weeks ago. We got feedback from the membership those scores were added here on this spreadsheet where you see in front of us and the, it, it automatically tabul tabulates the um, type of merit increase. You'll see though that there are a couple, there's two blank areas um, that we have, I believe are for Ortis. Um, the idea was that some can be filled in at the time of the meeting or make any changes at this time. I don't know if the membership want to go through each one of the um, items. And, and Rebecca, I don't know where there are comments that were provided. I don't see them here on the screen. Uh, the comments are separate as part of their, um, in the individual. Okay. Compilation. All right. Yeah, so if, if you go to the agenda item, I think it's attachment three, that actually has uh, comments uh, from each of the members. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, I can read them into the record or we, you know, I, I read them and appreciate everybody's comments that were provided. Uh, so the only question I have for you, Mr. Executive Director, is uh, I can see that the mathematical computations for the two missing um, uh, questions from Mayor Ortis Sorry. is not calculated in. So it's not weighted as a zero or it's not weighted as anything. Uh, how do you propose, since um, Mr. Ortis is not here, how do you propose to um, rectify this? Actually, to be very frank with you, um, and I, I talked to him briefly this morning, and he's like, oh, don't worry about it. And I'm, I'm like, I don't care either. I mean, I'm fine leaving them blank and letting it go that way. It's just Frank forgot to fill them out. I don't know how, but he did. So I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. 
So um, leaving them blank uh, does have the potential to impact the merit increase. That, yes, it does. And so, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and guess what it would have been considering um, <laughs> Mayor Ortis made straight fives. But, but I do think that um, with the, the, you know, the current situation and technology, maybe there was some um, challenges. So um, I don't know what this equates to monetarily, um, but I, I feel, uh, did anybody reach out to the mayor, um, not the executive director, but did anybody from staff or the attorney reach out to Mayor Ortiz in an email? Yes, David did uh, multiple times. <laughs> in an email advising that two scores were missing? Yes. Because I will tell you, I got an initial email for his, uh, but no one emailed me to let me know that my scores were missing and all of my scores were missing. I noticed so, that. <laughs> and I, I uh, didn't realize it till I saw the agenda. So uh, that's why I'm asking the question if someone specifically reached out in, in an email to Mayor Ortis advising him that those two scores were missing. And if he responded in any way, is David yeah. online? David yeah. isn't on, unfortunately. Okay. Michael, do you have information on that? Or I don't John? have any. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know if he reached out to him again to, to specify um, that these were blank. I believe, the, if I'm not mistaken, Rebecca, is this spreadsheet live? So if scores were to be put in, we could see how it changes the overall merit increase? Yes, I did update this this morning. Uh, this item with uh, Blattner's uh, scores, because I did receive that uh, yesterday. And um, my uh, my system, or the system went down, so we had to wait until this morning for, for it to be uploaded. So uh, there has been updates even since, uh, uh, Ms. Good, you had yours up there, or when it was blank at that time. So it, it's been consistently being updated, that attachment. And can uh, just to add to this, um, basically, I can't get more than a 3% uh, salary increase. So with this merit increase of a representative of 4.61, uh, I'd still only get a 3%. So um, that was going to be my next question. So I guess the, the way the, the, the chart reflects uh, the merit increase, um, it, it looks as if you were going to get a 46 I can't tell if it's a six or a five, sorry. Six, six one, <laughs> four point six yeah. one. So um, it should really, um, you know, the line should just reflect the overall average and then maybe something that says qualifies for a 3% increase. Because if you look at this, the way this chart looks from the public, you would think that um, Mr. Stewart is getting a 4.61% merit increase. Uh, second and, Vice Chair, if I may, just so if I may add, you're correct on that. It's, it's supposed to be consistent with what uh, the rest of MPO staff receives during this fiscal year. And the way, it's, the way it is right now, it's, there's a, it's done as a merit increase to a maximum of 3% added to the base. The balance then is a one-time bonus. So you are correct. It probably should reflect that in this case, Given the 4.61, it would be you know three percent, and then 1.61 1. as a one-time bonus. So and that's how has, that's so how we, we do get, all staff. Okay, so you do get more than the three percent. It's a it only, is a one-time only if it's yeah. bonus. Only if it's a bonus. Yeah, it it doesn't add long-term liability to the organization. That's and, and one the, of the things. That's right. The bonus doesn't uh, attribute in any way to uh, insurance or uh, anything else. It's just a bonus one time. It doesn't relate to the salary when you do this next year. It's OK. I'm just asking the question. I'm sorry. I don't have his contract in front of me. So his contract doesn't speak to a maximum of three percent. It's not a contract issue. It's a uh, policy oh. across the board for all staff members. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Is there not some way you can call Frank? 
and yes. get him to fill that in before we're finished with this. If you could make him on the phone. He's at the uh, Pembroke Pines food distribution, so he might not answer. You want me just, to just, just, you just a comment. David was relentless in calling me for mine. I, I'm sorry. If somebody doesn't complete it, they don't complete it. Uh, well, I can you know, tell you, I got, I didn't get one phone call. So, well, I got, I guess I'm treated numerous, differently, but I didn't get one phone call. Numerous emails and phone calls from David. Well, I hope, I, I hope he's not treating you differently. So maybe he was calling your aid. I don't know. Right. I, don't know. I, I mean, I try to stay away from this pretty far since it's my evaluation. Okay. Alan's is a different story. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, I can say, I think I was the second person to get the evaluation in because I could see it being updated online. Um, Frank beat me, I believe, and then I was second. Um, so I never got a phone call either, but I turned it in prior to the deadline. So maybe it was just due to the fact that I think the deadline was May 1st. Mm, yeah, that, that might have been, that might have been correct, Chair. So, because I got mine in, I actually submitted two. I asked for a revision, and the second one, I think I got in on April 30th. So, um, that's that may be the reason I didn't receive a phone call, but it stated in the email to turn it in by April 30th. But I noticed that uh, Mayor Ortis's uh, scores were actually already updated. And actually, last year, I'm pretty sure he did he the same one thing. blank. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Last year he did this exact same thing. Yeah. So if I can comment to the fact that you know, we, you have you have uh, the scores are in. I mean, I I don't know if it, how it changes if you got a five or a four or if the mayor intended to to be uh, blank and um, just because that's what he's presented. Um, well, it's my opinion at this time. Uh, obviously, he was going for the Yahtzee all fives, but we don't know for certain and. <laughs> Maybe it was intentional, I'm not sure, but um, it still, it maxes out the raise at 3% and um, kind of belabored it enough, I think. I would yeah. recommend that we go ahead and just approve and send to the board for approval. As is, is what you're recommending? As is, it's not, it doesn't change, it's not weighted, so it's not a zero and it's not a five, so it doesn't significantly impact the overall score. And we're talking a couple dollars here and there. I'm, I'm very comfortable with this um, and, and I appreciate it. Are you 100% fine, Mr. Stewart? Yes, yes, 100%. Maybe we could send Frank a bill for the difference of uh, your <laughs> Well, my suggestion is, is that you accept it as it is and, move and just proceed because otherwise it looks like it has an opportunity to be modified after the fact. Do I have a motion to accept and send to the board? Yes, to <laughs> accept it as is. Okay. I'll second it. And it's been seconded by Mrs. Johnson. Uh, I'm, we're going to try to approve this by unanimous consent. If anybody objects, please do so now. No objection. There's no objection, so it has been approved by unanimous consent and sent to the board for approval. Okay, okay. now we're moving on to. Thank you. Executive committee action items. The first one, if I could get the council to read it by title. Uh, this is the action is motion to recommend Broward MPO accept the evaluation committee recommendation regarding general counsel's performance review. Okay, so this is just a holdover where we had a separate evaluation committee and a separate executive yes. board. So yes. it's uh, uh, just something that we have to do since we just approved it. So if I can get a motion to approve action item one. I'll move it, Patty Good. Okay, Mrs. Good moves it and seconded by? I'll second it. Mrs. Johnson, all right. Let's approve it by a unanimous consent if possible. If you Yay. object at this time, please object now. Seeing no objection, it is approved by unanimous consent. And moving on to action item two, general counsel, please read it by title. And yes, thank you for that uh, previous action. Uh, number two is motion to approve an agreement between the Broward Metropolitan Planning Organization and Benefuel, Swar and Associates uh, Inc. BSNA for enterprise resource planning, ERP software license support and maintenance in amount not to exceed $75,000. Okay, do we have any questions from the membership? 
Have there been any issues at all with the software? Um, no, actually, the software uh, is was customized for the MPO about uh, what four years ago now, three years ago, okay. mm -hmm. and we've been working with the uh, the group so that you know for now I think it uh, it's the recommendation of the CFO and John is on uh, that we continue utilizing this software. Um, it's been it, it's been helpful. Is there stuff you want to change up on? <laughs> Always thought, yes, there's, I, you know, everything can always be improved, but uh, they've been working with us on the improvements. And, um, you know, so that's, that's been a, a real positive experience. And, and uh, you know, this was actually supposed to be in front of you, Alan, what month was that? Um, oh, that's, six months, yeah. six months least, ago? Yes, sir, at least six months. So Is we, it not, was it not in front of him because the software didn't work? Oh, no, 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 no. Software is fine. Let's <laughs> check it. Let's yeah. check it. Yeah. Yeah. Software Actually, been, yeah. I was just going to mention that the software, there has been no issues with regard to the software and, and their responses. Uh, we just had some uh, some contract issues and, and obviously the pandemic and other things have gotten in the way of, of how, we're able, how we were proceeding and brought it forward. Yeah. Okay. I mean, honestly, right now, it wouldn't be prudent for us to try to build a new ERP system. The so, cost would be astronomical. Yeah, yeah, we're no, it's not in our budget to be able to do that, but there's still nothing wrong with this, so don't take that wrong, you know? <laughs> it's just, uh, if we were gonna change over the ERP system, we would need to budget for that because it took us about, uh, I wanna say what, about $500,000 to implement it the last time. Okay. Are there any other questions from the membership? Okay, seeing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve action item two. So moved. Moved by Mr. Furr and seconded. Second. By Mr. Blattner. Let's try to approve this by unanimous consent. If you object to the approval of this item, please object at this time. Seeing none, action item two is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, we're moving on to discussion items. Uh, the first is the Broward County's transportation surtax. Uh, Mr. Executive Director, can you give us a brief summary? Yeah, I, this has uh, been a, we've been working very well with county staff on the um, surtax and our, our, our staff that is funded through the surtax has been to work directly working with Gretchen and her team over at the county, um, as well as with all 31 cities. It's been a very positive on that side um, collaboration. Uh, unfortunately, what ended up happening, and this was actually brought to my attention um, by the city of Fort Lauderdale and a couple other municipal governments, including Coconut Creek. And they said, well, hey, did you see what they've put in the, the county, they being the county, have put into the contract language to receive um, uh, surtax funds for projects and we're not party to that agreement and so um, at no point had staff at the county reached out to the MPO and stated that they were putting in a conflict clause in language to receive surtax funding um, and but Fort Lauderdale saw it, and, 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 and Mr. Gabriel and had also talked to the city attorney as well as the county attorney regarding this. Um, I never got any communication from the staff we work with on a day to day basis, um, but I did at, um, at the conversation between myself, Alan, and the city of Fort Lauderdale sent a letter to, and you all were copied to uh, 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 Broward County Administrator uh, Bertha Henry on our objection to the conflict language. And it stands, and our objection still stands, that our organization wouldn't have a conflict since any one of our cities, regardless of what the contract actually says, we would always, as an organization, try to fund every transportation project with any available funds that are out there. So the conflict language that was placed in the, in the contracts to the cities for the surtax basically says, if you have a contract, and I'm paraphrasing, 
with the MPO or an ag agency that's uh, basically prioritizing the projects that you don't have the right to receive the funds and the county doesn't have to give you the funds. Uh, that's really what it boils down to. And so we have a services contract with multiple governments. However, the one with Fort Lauderdale was very specific because it actually involves hiring staff, um, direct staff. So we have four, actually up to five employees that are funded by the city of Fort Lauderdale to do their transportation planning, not necessarily uh, any other type of work, but just their transportation planning. Our commitments in that to the city ultimately is their own prioritized list of projects, a master plan of projects for them to have, and then come up with recommendations of where they can find money, including and not limited to the county surtax. However, it also includes state money, federal money, which would flow through the MPO, as well as we did commit to the city that we would provide a list of potential geo bond that they could go forward with like Hollywood has and Pompano has to actually fund projects beyond even the other surf tax amounts. So that is where we have a difference that is going on between the county administrator and the MPO. Alan has been working with the county attorney, Drew Myers. Um, it doesn't appear that there's legal basis for this language, um, but it was, you know, it appears that, you know, the administrator thinks that there's a perception of conflict and we don't believe that because the list that have been provided to the county were actually provided to the county by the cities prior to in, prior to the Fort Lauderdale agreement in particular. And it, the five-year program that is being developed at this point in time is based on the, pri the projects that were submitted prior to even doing work with the MPO. Um, so that's kind of where we are. If the language stays in, basically uh, the county administrator is actually having language in that conflicts with the role of an MPO. I mean, planning isn't our middle name and that is what we do. So whether it's at the beginning, the front end, helping a municipal government or a member government, in this case, even Broward County, to do a plan to figure out where monies come from. Um, and then in the back end, we fund projects or we provide shares of money for projects. That has never been a conflict issue for the organization. And Alan, I don't know if you want to add a little bit about some you know, legal conversation with us. Because if this doesn't go away, I can't, I don't know why we would continue to do the work with the county because planning is what we do. And I would prefer doing the planning, working with the county and the cities on transportation projects than just providing a rank list because that doesn't necessarily provide the input that we would necessarily have as an organization, as a planning organization for, you know, truly good projects for our region. Alan. Um, so Greg, I, I would just take, take it a little further because the, the conflict of interest paragraph actually goes beyond what you indicated. Um, that, is, that is what caught our attention, the part that you identified, but in the language of the, of the um, provision, it actually says that the municipality may not contract for the performance of a project management, no issue particularly there, but public education, we do that. Data related services, we do that. Transportation or transit planning, we do that. Grant management or surtax oversight. Grant management, we do. Surtax oversight, not necessarily. But those are the items that we particularly function as an entity that uh, a city would not be able to participate with the MPO or ask us to provide those services um, in any respect. Otherwise, it would be deemed a conflict. So in, a lot, in reality, the concern is a city would lose the surtax funding or could be subject to losing the surtax funding for any particular project if we do something in the future with that city or, um, or if the county decides that, that the conflict paragraph does in fact um, exist or, and apply it. 
so it brings great concern to us. I've had a number of conversations with the city, with the county attorney's office. Um, they, they've gone further. We, we also got an, an, audit, an auditor's opinion that came from the county that reflects that, that he believes that, uh, that there's a conflict. Um, and, and there's no, the issue is, you know, there's a, they're using words, conflict and perception, but there is no legal conflict. There's, there, we're a governmental agency. The states, the statutory provision for conflict that we all live by, all government officials live by, and you're all familiar, I'm sure, apply to people, not to entities. This, the Broward NPO doesn't gain any, any um, uh, financial benefit by contracting with these cities or doing additional work. It benefits the, the cities and the community. So it's been very frustrating in having to address it. We've written letters back and forth. We've had conversations back and forth. Um, but as of right now, the county staff has taken the, seems to have taken the position that that paragraph remains. Um, the cities have objected, uh, but I don't, I, I, I personally have not heard or seen any uh, willingness to modify or revise the paragraph. Um, just the other day, Drew Myers and I and one of his attorneys we're talking about what what could be done to resolve the issue between the two entities, the MPO and the, and the county, uh, and it's on their it's on their plate now, uh, because I've simply said I provided them with a memorandum of law as to the uh, issue of conflict. Uh, I've provided them with letters and information as to the uh, res our response. Um, this is on their ballywick. Uh, the only option that we necessarily have, and we've and we've placed it in front of the county is that if, if, if need be, uh, that we remove ourselves from the uh, county and stop participating with the county with regard to the surtax um, prioritization or whatever, whatever else that we do with them. Uh, and um, the contracts that we have with the county relating to that provide that it, we mutually would have to agree to cancel. So that's been, those words have been thrown out between the two entities that we would mutually agree to cancel our, um, our work with the county, but it's been no more than that. Um, we just can't flat out say we're done. So that's, that's where we are as of the moment. Um, I could get a call or an email and further information um, today because that's how it shows up. It just pops up. Uh, but we're we're frustrated, Commissioner. <laughs> I see you uh, there. So uh, I, I was hoping that at some point um, the two entities, the the governmental bodies, the staff members, um, can't continue having the conversation because, frankly, I'm wasting time and money doing that on your on the NPO behalf. I, I suggest that we need that it needs to to be clarified and corrected one way or the other, and we need to move on. So, um, Chair, yes, sir. Um, yeah, this, this, you know, this, I was surprised to see the, uh, the auditor's opinion, uh, because that, that kind of threw a wrench in everything a lot, but it was, you know, this is all stemming from the auditor's, um, look at all this. It does, I mean, it does in some ways reflect a little bit of the concern that I think the MPO board itself had, um, and, and that was a fairly, uh, robust conversation um, when when we were voting for for Lauderdale to get services from the MPO, because I think some people thought the same thing that there may be a conflict. So it's not it's not like it hadn't been thought of. Um, but I did when I did talk with Drew Myers, he thought he was looking for ways where there may be ways to build a firewall, and I think that's the you know that's the kind of tweak that may need to happen for this to work. Uh, that's, you know, and I know there, I know he's um, looking into those, you know, those possibilities. So that's kind of where it's at. But the auditor's opinion was a very pretty strong opinion. And that, you know, that was independent. That wasn't from Bertha. That wasn't from the commission. That's an auditor's uh, straight from the auditor, um, which, you know, has its own weight. It's a different, comes in with a different kind of weight. Just so everybody knows that. Um, so, Again, uh, I think both uh, Drew and Bertha are trying to look at ways, you know, if there's a way of tweaking this to do that. I'm happy to look into this a little bit more too. Well, if I can just 
add to that before if you give me a benefit because that that is a conversation I had with Drew. But if you if you recall, one of the things that we have done as an MPO is that the MPO has hired individuals to represent the county, um, and they, that's what they do. They work okay. for the county under our under our umbrella as the MPO. Um, the city of Fort Lauderdale, we follow the same process. We've, they've, we've hired individuals who work for the city. That's what they do. The city pays for them, but they're under our MPO umbrella and they work in our offices. So in effect, you can say that about, you know, building the, the wall, but the wall was already, was already established and provided for. And I actually offered to, uh, to Drew and to uh, his associate, Ben Cezillo, uh, I think his last name is, to come to the MPO offices to sit with Greg and, and staff and see how and why we're, you know, how we're actually functioning and what's happening so that there'd be a better understanding as to the, um, the process because um, that hasn't happened. Maybe the auditor needs to participate in that. But to the extent that this is a, a lead, you know, what's confusing to me is that there's a, he's complained that the auditor has referenced a legal conflict, but yet you don't have your attorney hasn't issued an opinion as to whether or not there's a legal conflict or, or not. And that's just up there in the air. I, I mean, do I need to go find an auditor's opinion as to whether there's an auditor's conflict? Um, I, I don't know that answer, but I, I do know that there's no legal conflict because governmental agencies can't can't have a conflict between each party. So I just leave it like that. I just wanted to make sure, Commissioner, refer that you you had the big the big picture in front of you, so that because uh, you're you're the only one who's there who can speak uh, on the whether it's on the MPO behalf or not, but at least speak to explain what's going on between the parties because right now it's only staff to staff. Okay, um, let me see if I can pull something together where, where we can all be talking about it so we all understand it and uh, we can go from there. Okay, because yes, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I saw this about, this was a couple of weeks ago that the auditor did this and I know, you know, I, I, I'd heard that you all were gonna be trying to talk, talk your way through this, but it sounds like you haven't been able to get through it. So let me intervene a little bit here and see where we can go. Yeah, it's not that the, the county staff that we work with day to day hasn't been, you know, we've been working with them. Um, but there that there seems to what happened is there's with the administrator. Um, it does. It just doesn't seem she did put in uh, at the end of her letter that she just sent um, a, a paragraph or a sentence in there that seemed to open up some light of negotiation. But yeah. um, even Chris Lagerbloom, the city manager of Fort Lauderdale, Greg Harrison, Pompano Beach, Lazier down in Hollywood. Um, everybody's like looking at this going, well, this is very punitive. This was very directed. Um, you know, where did this come from? When we did submit the letter to Bertha, there was no auditor's opinion at that time. And right. the auditor's opinion came out afterwards. Um, Alan, through our attorney's office, has had an ethics attorney uh, known in the state who came up, looked at it and said, there is no ethical because there can't be a conflict between governments like this. And, and you know, because the MPO itself, when we were even, let's, let's go back in history and Alan put that in the letter to the attorney that he wrote, it, there, the MPO used to be staffed by county staff. <coughs> and then we would recommend projects get funded at the county, for the county. Was that considered a conflict back then? No, it happened for two decades. So this is not something that, why wouldn't you recommend going to every potential funding source possible for a project? And because of the work with the city of Fort Lauderdale, it's beyond the surtax. You know, it's about regional transportation because, you know, Fort Lauderdale functions a little bit differently than most other cities. Um, you know, it's about projects for themselves. They have a, a parks bond that included um, uh, greenways projects that we're gonna be working with them on that we may be able to go after state and federal money for. There's discretionary that they may be doing in downtown Fort Lauderdale with the city, the MPO staff and um, the DDA uh, to go after some other monies at the federal level. This is something that we just do in a course of, of business. And then- Well, Greg, wasn't, it, wasn't, the only, wasn't the only conflict though between the, the surtax money and this, not the other stuff, right? They use the surtax. If I can just inter interject, they use the surtax as the as the uh, the, the the hammer 
uh, surtax funding because if you if there's a conflict of any you any type for any services uh, for that project they're going to withhold funding the surtax but that, funding. But that's where i thought that they were going to be trying to figure out a firewall so that you know the you could continue your contracts with all the cities but when it came down to the surtax there needed to be some distinction so that there wasn't any favoritism on stuff well there would i never think that's be. what it was coming down to but there can't ever be favoritism. I mean, you just can't do that. Let's look at, I'm gonna use the one-way pair in downtown, Fort Lauderdale, you know, the replacement of the wave. And basically as staff, we are gonna be working with the city of Fort Lauderdale and the county on trying to move that project forward. That is actually something the city put in prior to us even be providing services to them to do the planning with that. We have some money budgeted in our UPWP, there's money supposedly at the city level, the DBA put money in, the county's supposed to be putting money in through the surtax, and we're gonna be working on it with them. And that project by itself is one of those, this is where Chris, the city manager and I had the conversation. It's like, well, we need you at the table and plus you're doing our transportation planning. So I don't have to have more planners. They can utilize the planners you have on staff. And that from a consolidation of government, it makes a lot of sense. And it makes sense, and we're looking with Hollywood, and we've been doing this already with Coral Spring or with, you know, Coconut Creek, and we had a contract with Fort Lauderdale previously to do other work. So this is this this walling off of just this money, and it's only thirty million dollars a year if you think about it, you know, at ten percent. And Fort Lauderdale doesn't is it going to get thirty? Well, million? I mean, yeah, wow. but, but Greg, sometimes that goes up to fifty and sixty million dollars. Well, that's so. It's, We'll have another conversation but, 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 offline but, on but, that. But, <laughs> but the bigger issue is how to make sure that it, there's there's fairness to all the cities. So, but there is. So, uh, what I've done is I've asked uh, the general counsel to ask for an attorney general opinion, and he's already submitted to me um, the uh, seven point prong um, plan of the question, uh, just to get an attorney general's opinion, uh, for better or for worse. And uh, if it turns out that uh, our council's firm is correct that there cannot be a conflict between two government agencies because there's nothing to be gained by an individual. And if the county doesn't remove the language, then we'll look for a mutual termination uh, in the near future. And if it turns out that there is a conflict, then we'll need to terminate for uh, having a conflict and, and it conflicting with the other uh, contracts that we've acquired. Well, it's also just our member governments uh, it could be the county that would, if, if the, I mean, we do the same work for the county. We, we uh, provide services throughout the, uh, and, and the school board. I mean, the school board may, doesn't have the opportunity to get uh, funding, but it could. Uh, but this applies to everyone. And, it's, and that's the frustrating part about the conversation that we keep having, because it's only being used or thought of myopically. Uh, in the as it applies only to, to the surtax, but the reality is, is that yes, this agreement says that. But if the city, we, look, we don't need to have this contract with, with the city of Fort Lauderdale to be doing this work for the city of Fort Lauderdale. We would be doing that anyway. We would be we're doing this kind of work for other cities that don't have this uh, these kinds of contracts. But the difference really is, is that they're so time consuming. There's there's so much work that's necessary. They the cities are looking for dedicated employees. MPO employees to work on their particular projects so that they can be serviced. And that's not fair to the other cities too, because it takes away the employees that the MPO has available to the community and whatnot. So these are the conversations, frankly, that we've been, that I've been having with Drew. Um, okay. big, those big picture discussions. And, and I do want to share one other thing too, you know, for you to have a perspective as from the county. So right now we're getting surtax funding from the county for these two employees to help rank you're gonna come back and ask us for federal and state money to match surtax projects on corridors for transit and for other, other projects. Why is that not the same argument that your auditor is saying? Because you're paying us to do this. And so why, why would we favor you for any other project? It's the, there's this really weird one way communication that's going on. And that's the thing I'm, I'm grateful for Drew. I'm grateful for Alan, you know, I've, that's You're not an, grateful for me? <laughs> no, I, I'm grateful for you. Not yet. <laughs> I will be oh. grateful when you solve this. 
Um, but, you know, the big thing is, is the Gretchen and the, that team, they're not involved in this either. They didn't bring it to our attention even. Right. And so, I mean, it, it's it's so, un, it's this unfair position that we were put into, you know. Okay, well, it, let me do this. Let me just, let me start to uh, see if I can wrap my arms around it. Because I, I was hoping that the two, that the two lawyers would figure, figure out a way to do some firewall to make this happen. Obviously, they did so uh, let me let me see what I can do there. All right, then I'll be thankful for you. So stop! Don't don't say yeah. that I'm not <laughs> conditional. I see it's always conditional. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So, um, so this was the letter that was submitted by the county auditor. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Chair? So, do, um, so. In order to get an opinion from the attorney general, does the can the chair ask that on his own? I know that in the past, I don't know if it's sometimes it's required to have some kind of body action from the. That's from correct. The That's correct. And and frankly, I, I uh, the chair is uh, has the authority under our rules to give direction to the executive director and to the attorney as well. Uh, but frankly, I mean, if the executive committee would uh, take a vote to, uh, uh, you know, just kind of confirm that that would be something we would include as part of the uh, opinion uh, the request. Uh, I would make that motion. I just wouldn't want, um, you know, I appreciate him taking the initiative. I just don't want to waste time and it go up and then they respond with, sorry, we can't respond unless you take affirmative action. So I would just rather do that if, if it's... Um, if it's possible. And the other thing that I wanted to uh, comment on was if, um, if we have the opportunity to get an auditor opinion from an independent auditing firm, not one affiliated with uh, Broward County. Uh, well, we have our own auditor that, uh, we, that we work with uh, and reviews our, our documents and finances. Um, it's on contract, I believe, Mike. Correct. Yeah. Um, Correct. So, I mean, we could, we, uh, Michael or, or some, we could ask for that to be, to look at and see whether or not the auditor even, our auditor even believes that that's an appropriate, excuse me, uh, Commissioner, but whether that's even an appropriate opinion from an auditor for that purpose. I, I don't know what auditor rules and regulations are, if, they, if that even exists that way. And, and let me, let me intervene for one second here. The, in the, in the end, the county is responsible for how that surtax money gets spent. And so we, we have to rely on our auditor and, and our lawyers to make sure that we're doing this right. And I think everybody, you know, I think everybody appreciates that. I'm happy, I, I'm happy to see other opinions, but I mean, in the end, we, you know, for okay, our- Okay, well for, then, um, then I think it's appropriate that we go to the state because there's no, more formal um, overarching opinion than that of uh, the, the state attorney general. So yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I, we, I, we, I feel better that. Unless, I mean, do you want to wait till? No, uh, I don't want to wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cities are. In well, I, 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 but I, I guess what I wanted to know is I'm not, I'm not sure how you're framing what the question is to the attorney general. I don't know how this is framed yet. No. And, no. and without, what's that? So the first part is the general statutory description of the powers and duties of the MPO based on Florida statute. The second is the overview of the Broward MPO. The third is the discussion of the Broward County Transportation Surtax Ordinance and responsibilities granted to Broward MPO. The fourth is discussion of the interlocal agreement between Broward County and municipalities for surtax funded municipal transportation projects. The fifth is analysis of section 6.7 of the interlocal agreement conflict of interest paragraph. Then it's the summary of conflicts of so. cause. Uh, if conflict of interest provision enforced municipality <coughs> county surtax funding for their municipal transportation projects would be precluded from entering into subsequent uh, agreements with the Broward NPO until county surtax funded project funding ends. Uh, so basically, it's just comprehensive of this is what statutes say, this is our interlocal agreement, this is the conflict language that is raised by the county, um, the opinion from the firm on their side, the conflict 
uh, as identified by uh, Bertha Henry and County Auditor um, and to see if that exists. I get, I get to the chair. Mm -hmm. um, I guess part of what I, I, I mean, that sounds pretty good. It's one of those things where when you're asking for attorney general opinion, it's one of those ones where I would like to see both Drew and Alan frame that together in such and, and be in agreement with how it's being framed to be able to send it. And I don't know if that, I don't know if Drew has had a chance to see it. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I think that would be the better way to do it because you're asking, you know, you're asking for is, you know, we might be at loggerheads here. And what you're trying to do is make sure that everybody, and if you're at loggerheads, mm -hmm. you want to say, well, here's where we're, our, you know, we're, we're having an impasse here, but we need it. We need a third opinion. But right now it's just coming from one side. It really needs to be something that both sides agree on what the, what the um, disagreement is and allow it be sent together so that both sides are protected on the back end. That's my thought. I think it'd be a better way to do it. Yeah, Commissioner, so um, if I can just comment to uh, what we're intending to do is provide the documents that we receive from the, from the uh, administrator and from the auditor as the basis for the you know, the county's position. That is what that is all we have to work with. And it's, it's using that and their and the county's position that has been handed to us, has provided to us, that we pass the uh, uh, Review. And I appreciate that, but I think it might be better submitted. I think it might be better submitted by both. Uh, Mr. Stewart or Mr. Kaleka? Somebody has a TV on or something. Uh, I'm getting so much feedback. I'm having a problem. Oh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Blackner. Um, this is such a waste of time and money. That we almost have. We almost Are have we to have interference. What's going on here? I think if everybody mutes and then let the chair or let the uh, uh, commissioner Blattner speak. Uh, Mr. Stewart, it looks like it's coming from you. <laughs> yeah, there's us. There is something going on in the background in my house as well. So what I'm, what I'm, I want to just spend a few minutes. So this is not a debate or discussion between Commissioner Fur and Mr. Gabriel and Mr. Stewart or Mr. Koletka. Uh, this is this is a fundamental um, discussion that uh, needs to be resolved through the legal system. Uh, why would the county not have said to Mr. Gabriel and Mr. Stewart? Hey, we think there's an issue here. Can we discuss this? Rather than saying, um, doing what they did. It continues to puzzle me of why everything boils down to a discussion and a dispute between the county and the cities. Let's go back. When the surtax was proposed, the county said to every, every municipality had to sign into it, agree to it, or they wouldn't be able to share anything. So every city signed into the surtax in anticipation that it would be fairly administered. And I think it's probably in the charter of the, uh, the surtax that the role of the cities and the county is, is clear. Since that time, three cities have, a, have passed general obligation bonds. What that has done, is, is plus the county, what that has done is created a huge manpower problem to staff up to accomplish all the work that has to be done through the general obligation bonds that the cities have passed and the surtax. And so cities reach out to the MPO and say, how can you help us? And we say, well, we not only can, we want to. That is part of our mission. So we do this, this has been going on now for some period of time, and all of a sudden an auditor not the county attorney and not the county executive decides that something is wrong. Here. It puzzles me that any every time this stuff comes up, it's not a discussion. It's not sit around the table and work it out. It's my way or the highway. And so 
I'm going to support uh, a school board member Good's motion to uh, do what is necessary to provide a, a Chair Kaletka and Mr. Stewart and Mr. Gabriel with the ammunition to go to the state's attorney for a resolution of this. Because clearly, Alan and Drew can meet and have coffee every day of the week. And I don't think this is going to get resolved at that level. Okay, is that a second uh, for Mr. Black? Yes, it is. Okay, so I do have a motion and a second um, to ask for an attorney general's opinion. Is there any discussion? Uh, you've heard my you've heard my thoughts. I have I have uh, just a quick point. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, I think we should pursue, as my motion indicates. Um, I still don't think, um, uh, sorry, I got a pop-up on my screen here. Um, I, I don't think it would hurt that uh, some kind of conversation is had between the attorneys um, before the letter is sent. Um, <coughs> try to capture the essence of what we're trying to get an answer for. Um, you know, they it's, it's certainly, you know, uh, our council is is the one that's uh, going to work with the chair and getting this accomplished. But but I don't think anything would um, would hurt if the he had a conversation with the county uh, respective attorney. So I don't want it to be um, what stops this letter from moving forward. But I don't think there's anything to prevent the conversation from taking place as Commissioner Fur has requested in an effort to, to try to get a meeting of the minds, so to speak, as best as possible. But at a certain point, the letter's gonna have to go. So that is just my comment. Thank you. And and if mm -hmm. I can, and, yes, and I think at, at the minimum, um, it would be a courtesy to do that to to our county attorney so that the okay. county's not blindsided. I exactly. think that I think I think that kind of cooperation I think there's been good cooperation over the last couple of year, a year and a half. I'd like to see that continue. And I think by um, having a chance for Drew to review that, um, even comment on it would be, a, would be a better way to go about it. I think we're all in agreement that any input to make it more authentic is welcomed. So Mr. Chair, if I can just comment, um, um, just to be clear, I, in my last conversation with Drew, I did advise him that uh, there was discussion on our part to uh, um, potentially seek a attorney general opinion on this matter and that uh, to make him aware of it, asking him to uh, at least try to um, give me some clarity as to what the real issue might be from the county uh, as okay. to the paragraph or whatever it might be. Uh, that was, I believe, Monday um, or Tuesday. Uh, days get lost. Uh, but the point, the point, that was Tuesday. The point, though, is that, is that I asked them to provide me with some material or backup information or, an exp or, or some kind of focused area that they might be uh, willing to address. Um, and that was supposed to be coming the next day. I'm just, and I'm not throwing them under the bus, just telling you, I have not received any response or any information since that conversation on Tuesday. So, I have been attempting that, and I did make them aware of where, where we're heading. And um, I would not hesitate to, part, you know, to uh, at least seek out their uh, comments or suggestions. That's not an issue to me. But at the end of the day, it is our. It, I represent the MPO, and I would write something that is to seek the um, not a, um, in, you know, a, I want to say it's more neutral, but the correct answer as it relates to the MPO, and it would come from us. So just to be just to be clear, that's the background where we are. Um, okay. unless, unless and I and I don't mind prompting Drew to, to get back with you. And I will tell you, we, we get opinions from the auditor oftentimes. We don't always agree with. Him. You know, he gives that. he gives recommendations and we have to decide policy issues based on that. It yes. is you know, it's not a you know, it's not a legal opinion. It is an auditor's opinion, but it is something that has its own weight. And we have to deal with that. So, you know, I will, if you could, I'll, I'll prompt Drew to get in touch with you real quick, though. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on this item before we take a vote?
hearing if we can approve this by unanimous consent if you object to the direction to get an attorney general's opinion please object now i'm gonna object um yes i'm gonna object on it okay. not that i don't mind doing it at another point i would just rather do it in a different way that's all okay uh, there is an objection, so we're going to do a roll call vote. Ms. Schultz, please call the roll. All right. First off, uh, Chair Kalecka. Yes. His response is yes. Uh, Deputy Vice Chair Good. Yes. Her response is yes. Uh, Chair Emeritus Blattner. Yes. His response is yes. Commissioner Furr? No. His response is no. Uh, board Member Johnson? Yes. His response, her response is yes. That's uh, four yeses and one no. The motion passes. All right, thank you. Uh, General Counsel, you have your marching orders. Yes, sir. Okay, we're moving on to discussion item two. This one should go very quickly. Um, it's just actions of the chair. I wanted to put this on the agenda just to have transparency on all of the orders that I have given uh, and directed to the MPO. Real simple, uh, there have been four. Uh, the first one was to order remote working until the end of March, and that was to take place I believe, on March 15th, but basically to the end of March. The second one was to work remotely till the end of April. And the third one was <laughs> to work remotely till the end of May. Um, I will say this on that is that um, according to my council meeting that I had last night, we are looking to go to a live meeting at the next um, uh, second or the third Wednesday in May. Um, mm -hmm. It was the opinion of our mayor that the executive order from uh, Ron DeSantis was not going to take us out to the third uh, Wednesday in May and that we'd be required to have uh, in-person meeting again. So just that was the information that was conveyed to us last night. Um, and the fourth executive order or, or the fourth order that I gave to the um, MPO was uh, the cancellation of the retreat that was supposed to take place on April 1st and direct the executive uh, director to cancel the contract. I spoke with the, our general counsel about that, and there's a cancellation clause in general that he can exercise, but given the circumstances of COVID and the uncertainty that we will have uh, the ability to meet, uh, that seemed like the best course of action. Are there any questions about those four orders? Mr. Chair, if I can just ask, were, yes. you, su were you suggesting that, that the MPO go back to the building and start having meetings as of um, the June meeting? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I think it's prudent to wait to see if the governor is going to make any changes first. So we have basically a month before that decision has yeah. to be made and we're definitely gonna comply with state and federal laws. Okay, I just wanted to be clear as to the comment. And, and just to, to share, since you know, this came up as far as where the meeting would be, we're, we're trying to figure out the social distancing on the dais yeah. and then the oh, potential of, uh, yeah, and then also then figure out how we could maybe integrate half the board or more than half the board utilizing this format. We'll see how it goes with people physically present as well. And I think the county commission's already done that. Miami-Dade's been using Zoom, but they have not been having at, at, you know, people in the audience and as well as people on the dais. Greg, so, can, you keep, can you keep me 50 feet from Blattner? <laughs> <laughs> it may not be enough. <laughs> I know. <laughs> if I okay. could just interact. Um, so the governor's order that he, um, that he has entered currently um, it does not expire. It, it goes uh, until, until he issues a new order that would... Um, uh, modify um, the sunshine regulations allowing for the um, um, virtual meetings that we're having. Um, so to the extent that that is the regular, the, the governor's orders right now, we are able to, to uh, continue that indefinitely. Um, but to the point of the chair Kaleka, uh, that could change any time. And it might be prudent for us to start going back to the building. I guess that would be the tie-in because you can't have a meeting, a board meeting without having staff present in the building. 
And that's the other thing. So if we go back to phase one, I think of the 40 employees, we'd probably have around 12 to 14 present. Um, unfortunately, I have asthma as well as some of the other staff members. So we necessarily, I, I, I'm actually in, the, in one of the groups that says, you know, you shouldn't be part of the first return. Um, so we have to figure all of that out. And then, I mean, we've also been, and this is a little more detailed rabbit hole stuff for you all, but because our halls are so tight, I actually, we have to come up with a circulation plan. So when you come in the front door of the main office, literally you'd have to go all the way around and then back down the center hall and then come back in to get to your office. You're not supposed to, to have, um, bypass, you're not supposed to pass each other with the uh, social distancing requirements from the CDC. And then um, there's also, we've discussed maybe having 12 people come in one week and then another 12 the next week and the, the first 12 go out um, and have the office deep cleaned, uh, you know, to make sure that uh, the viruses aren't living on surfaces, uh, you know, and, and people would travel in groups. So there's all these other things that would happen if we actually go to having everyone at the dais and we may actually have to have st some staff come in and present electronically as well, because even the audience area in the uh, boardroom would have to have the six foot separation between people in the audience. And, you know, while Commissioner Fur doesn't want to be near, near Commissioner Blattner at the moment, I'm also right next to the podium within spitting distance. Of the no, wait, next, to, next to me. Oh, well, can really? I have a comment? It's yes. still a little premature. This I just wanted to give an update on the actions that I had taken. Um, we're still more than a month out. Uh, Mrs. Good? Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, we, I don't see why we couldn't have meetings. Um, uh, we, you know, we've had school board meetings. I know commissions have had their commission meetings. Uh, we use Microsoft Teams. Um, I just feel whatever is done, be done in a secure manner. It still provides the public opportunity for public input. It provides staff an opportunity to present information. So I know it's, it definitely has its challenges, but um, I think we should at least try to have uh, some kind of uh, regular meeting utilizing the technology in a way that uh, gets the business of the MPO done. Um, so um, I think uh, we should continue to try to do that. So I think this functioned well today and the first meeting will definitely have its challenges and maybe it'll minimize the discussion that we sometimes have uh, in a sense of not, you know, uh, the important discussion, but you know, and, um, and I think uh, we'll, we'll stay focused on what we need to get accomplished. So I would at least try Mr. Chair to um, have a meeting virtually. It'll keep uh, the staff, uh, and the public and those attending safe uh, while still doing what we need to do as, a, as an MPO because we have an obligation, so. Duly noted, thank you for your comments. Um, we're moving on to uh, discussion item three. And thank you, uh, Mrs. Eriks, for staying on for the whole meeting. It's now 10.51. Uh, it's time for the state legislative update. Well, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, I've been getting kicked on and off, so I've got my phone on as backup too, and we've got uh, my team on as well, so they're ready to kick in if I kick off, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, first, I wanna thank you so much for the relationship that we have with you. Um, it's good to be home, even under these circumstances. We're sorry that we're not all together, but hopefully we will be together soon. I wanna introduce everybody on the phone. Um, I'm sure you all know them, but I wanna make sure that everybody knows. I think Chris Smith is trying to get on. Um, I don't know if he's, uh, if he's been able to or not, but uh, he's with us, also Lauren Jackson, Robbie Holroyd, and of course, Cheryl Simon. Um, just a reminder for um, a resource to you, when we're up in Tallahassee full time, Cheryl stays here at home in Broward and will continue to be a resource as we go back and forth, depending on if we have to go back up um, for a special session. But we'll get back into that a little bit. Um, I really, again, just wanna say thanks again for the relationship. And uh, we'll go in how, you know, we usually do this very interactively, which I'd like to do. It might be a little challenging um, under these circumstances, but what we'll do is um, I'll do a quick overview um, and then I'll have Lauren and Robbie go in and do the bills um, presentation for the legislation. And then we can either have an interactive conversation as that goes on, or you can hold your questions um, and discussion for afterwards. So however the group would like to proceed, um, but you know, 
it's, it's at your pleasure. But uh, again, um, there are a lot of appropriations bills that were um, filed. Uh, we'll see where that goes, obviously, in the current situation that we're at. Um, but a very low number of policy bills were passed. Um, they passed only actually four more bills than the 2019 um, legislative session, which holds the record for the lowest number passed. Um, you know, just to set the stage a little bit, um, in, in many years past, and you guys have been around for you know, years um, before to understand some of the conflicts that we've had up in Tallahassee. But there really was a, uh, a fantastic um, relationship between the legislative branch and the executive branch. So the governor and the Senate and the House really did work very closely together, especially on the budget um, when they came down to it. I mean, it was at the fact where literally if we were putting appropriations forward and not saying we, but legislators, they were in close contact with the governor's office to see whether or not there was a probability of the veto um, going in. And if it was going to be vetoed, they were not even putting it in the budget. So, um, you know, that's a collaboration that we haven't seen for a very long time. Um, but the majority of also the governor's priorities were uh, passed. So there was a collaboration, like I said, um, very different than other years. And then, you know, we're very happy um, about the transportation work program that was fully funded at $9.2 billion. The overall budget was at $93.2 billion. But as you all know, the budget has yet to been set to the governor because of the situation that we're in. They still haven't decided whether or not we're going to go back for a special session, but we'll go more into that afterwards. So um, if there's no questions on just that beginning presentation, um, you know, I'll kick it over to Lauren and Robbie for uh, the presentation of the bills, and then we'll uh, talk more about um, collaboration and state effort. Happy thank birthday, Kim. Ah, thank you, Commissioner, I appreciate <laughs> it. And I don't know, can everyone see my see the, the PowerPoint? Yes. 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 Okay, awesome. I wasn't sure if that, that was showing or not. Um, so then this this was the, the overview that Candace kind of just went over. Um, but to get into transportation policy, uh, just a quick reminder of what the, the priorities that were adopted by the board. Um, a lot of these priorities, we were able to lay some solid groundwork for the next session um, in our meetings with the FDOT secretary, his staff, uh, uh, lawmakers, and um, members in relevant associations that we, that we are a part of with the MPOAC, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't much of an opportunity to pursue them at this time. Um, thankfully, we haven't seen uh, the proposals that would have limited um, board membership that, that we had in the past. Um, so we did not have to play defense uh, so much this year. And of course, we're always um, on guard to make sure that trip funding isn't further impacted. Um, but for the offensive side, um, we do feel like we were able to lay some solid groundwork um, and, and continue to move forward with those. Um, in the next legislative session. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to jump in at any time. Um, so what passed, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these, um, but just to touch on a few of the big ones. And then if you have any questions about anything else, I'm happy to address those. Um, but so the main one is this essential state infrastructure that ended up being a Senate president priority um, because it, it had language that furthered his MCOR's expansion of the turnpike um, in the rural areas um, by directing the Department of Transportation to work with DEM to set up emergency staging areas along the turnpike. Um, and it prioritized counties with populations that were 200,000 or less. Um, so it was particular to those areas. Um, but what it also did is it directed FDOT to come up with a statewide master plan for um, electric vehicle infrastructure uh, along the state highway system. And they, will, they are directed to work with the PSC and with the Office of Energy under FDAX uh, to, to um, specifically on different, different elements of that statewide master plan, um, as well as coalitions such as the Clean Cities Coalition. It, it says as many coalitions as deemed necessary um, that they would be working with that. Um, and uh, that roadmap, at least the, the Office of Energy has already gotten started on, on elements that they want to have included, um, but we, we can adjust that uh, later uh, if you have any questions. Um, sorry. And then with um, the e-bikes, uh, we were, we were grateful that our coalition was able to keep local control in, in that legislation. 
Um, and, and that was partially due to the work that we did last year in ensuring local control in the micro mobility bill. Um, and then also with the SLIP study, which is the SB 178, um, we're going to continue working with our, our seaports uh, in the interim and working in the rulemaking process with FDOT um, and, F and um, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection on, on this bill as they do the rulemaking process. But what that bill would do is it would require a sea level impact projection study for any state funded construction project in a coastal construction zone. Um, but there's going to be some hurdles before that goes into effect. Um, and like I said, there's going to be some rulemaking process. So we are going to continue to work it with, with the agencies on that. Um, then there were a few miscellaneous provisions that also passed in different bills. Uh, just for one example, the housing package actually prioritized um, access to public transportation and uh, reducing parking for applications on, on sale uh, projects, so, which is um, part of the housing trust fund uh, projects. Hey, Lauren, so, can I ask you something real quick? Absolutely. On the sea level impact projection, did they accept our uh, ULI from the compact down here? Did they accept the ULI from the, the compact? The, 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 no, the, the unified projection, unified sea level projection from the Southeast Florida compact. They on, did not go, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. That would have determined what the projection was. They did not go into all of that in the actual legislation. Instead, a lot of it was left up to rulemaking. Um, okay. And right. they, there was another bill that actually was going to set up a task force, um, a sea level rise task force that was supposed to kind of come up with these projections that would then be used for this. Uh, but that bill did not pass. Um, but I think that the Office of Resiliency and FDEP are going to be um, um, looking at how to make those projections. And then that's what's going to um, that's what they're going to base it on. And I'm sure that they they were, they're going to be looking at the ULI um, that you guys adopted. So, um, but it wasn't addressed specifically in the legislation, what the, what the projection would be based on. Yeah. They just be, they just be reinventing the wheel if they did that because they've already had, you've already have all the, you know, acad academicians and uh, universities have come and scientists have kind of figured it out from here, even though we just kind of, made it rise a little bit but we'll see very good point yeah um and then it, it unless anyone else had any questions i'm going to move on to what failed um and just to highlight a couple of these and feel free to ask uh about any of those that you see um but the f dot packages did fail this year um which is not unusual usually uh it's every few years that the f dot package passes um, and it kind of ended up all over the board. Um, it ended up, ended up getting stuck in Senate committees um, and that's why it ultimately did not pass. Um, but essentially it would have increased uh, the minimum, minimum allocation to, or not increased it, sorry. It would have made it permanent uh, for $5 million to the Inter Intermodal Logistics Center mm -hmm. Infrastructure Support Program, um, but that helps fund rail, roadways and other conveyances of goods from, from seaports. Um, and it would have done some other things as well. Like it would have moved up the, the deadline for MPOs to submit their local work programs um, in order to accommodate for early session. Um, and, it, and it would have, uh, sorry, strengthened move over laws, remove the cap on debt service for right of way acquisition and bridge construction, increase the state's liability insurance for passenger rail, um, lower, thresholds for TNC self-insurance um, and other items like that. The biggest thing that it did was it moved rail safety and development responsibilities from the Florida Rail Enterprise to FDOT. Um, and so that was that was sort of the crux of the bill. Um, however, it did not it did not make it. Um, mid block crosswalks was also a big deal um, that would have that mid that legislation was because a young constituent died. Uh, while crossing a crosswalk um, in Representative Fine's district. And they felt that the signals on that crosswalk were too confusing, that it gave a false sense of safety to the pedestrian um, and, and um, didn't, didn't sufficiently stop the motorists. Um, and that was a, the rapid flashing beacon signs. So he introduced legislation that would have eliminated all of those signs. All of the signals would have had to change at the mid-block 
mid block crosswalks. Um, it was a huge fiscal. Um, he did narrow it down over time, uh, working with, with our coalitions. The Florida League of Cities was very involved and so was the MPOAC. Um, and so they narrowed it down even further, uh, exempted two lane roads that were less than 35 miles per hour. Um, but I, we do anticipate that that bill would return. Um, of course, it just depends, I think, on what the fiscal impact is and, and certainly what the fiscal state of our local governments and the state itself uh, will be after the pandemic. Um, but those are the main ones I wanted to hit on. If you guys have any other questions. Oh, also, I did fail to include on here um, under what failed the transportation disadvantage bill um, that uh, that it, which would have increased cooperation between the counties um, to make it more seamless if people needed to cross county lines while using our transportation disadvantage system. It passed the House. It almost got through the Senate. It, it ended up getting stuck in its final Senate committee. So if, mm -hmm. I don't know if Candace, if you want to keep on this sure. one. Or does anybody have any questions regarding the legislation that Lauren mentioned or anything that I mean, I know that we had provided a, in the session report as well. So we want to make sure that we keep this fluid or we could have a full discussion at the end of the presentation. Um, this is Greg. I'd like to just only interrupt for the um, for the work program. We are mm -hmm. still we are still providing the work program and all the product earlier, even though legislatively it's not required. I just wanted to clarify just because gotcha. a lot of the past doesn't mean we're still not doing it. Thank you. Right, correct. Yeah, that was so that was codifying it um, and, and unifying. But um, right, thankfully, I think that we we get it ahead of time. So um, looking ahead, you know, obviously, we're still in the cone of uncertainty. I mean, I kind of hate to utilize that. But and we're also going into hurricane season, which I don't know. Um, so we are trying to figure out exactly where we're going from this time. You know, we've been monitoring all the communications um, out of the governor's office. I'm hoping that you are um, receiving our updates on that. We've, every press conference, every um, emergency order, uh, really trying to make sure that communication is key right now with what's going out of the governor's office and what's happening on a local level as well. Um, you know, the budget has not yet been sent to the governor. That's the big question. Um, I don't know if Chris got on or not. I'm in close contact. With yes, him. I'm on. Oh, hey, Chris, if you want to right. jump in right there, do you have any indication? I know that we're kind of, you know, working both leadership and both sides of the aisle. And um, I know that uh, you might have a little bit of insight on recent communications as of the last time we spoke. Has anything new um, been communicated regarding the special session? Well, I think they're, they're more dug in of not having a special session. I know the House Democrats um, sent in the, the paperwork to do a special session. And that kind of jump started the conversation, but it jump started it in the direction of uh, we're not ready to have a special session and we're not envisioning a special session, especially on the Senate side. I spoke personally with uh, Senator Galvano. He thinks the budget that was put forth can still be worked um, without coming in and redoing it. Um, he's, he's close to sending it over to the governor, which will start the clock. Um, they just wanted to make sure that their projections uh, were correct. Of course, COVID has changed you know, some of the projections but the state has been in a good financial health that they don't think has changed as much as requiring a special session to go in and do another budget. No, and we appreciate that. And then, you know, for that, you know, we won't know the full extent of April's damage until mid to late May from the projections. So um, thanks, Chris. And we'll obviously keep the group, um, you know, aware of anything that changes since things change on a daily basis, uh, kind of like regular session. Um, but also to touch base on the governor's task force, you know, during the governor's task force to reopen Florida, many conversations centered around accelerating transportation projects that were already in the pipeline in order to ensure um, continuity um, in construction jobs while taking advantage of lower traffic congestion. So I also wanted to mention that uh, the governor worked with FDOT, uh, the FDOT secretary um, and chose a project to accelerate in each um, district and district forest project was in Palm Beach County. Um, I, Lauren, Robbie, do you have anything to add? I mean, like I said, I mean, we've been updating everybody. We're, we're waiting to find out whether or not we're going to be reopening sooner rather than later, but I'll switch it over to my team to kind of add to anything on the recovery issue. Um, I, I think just piggybacking off of some of the federal conversations as well, and in light of the conversations around a special session, um, 
there's a big debate right now about whether a lot of the spending authority actually has to be allocated through a special session or can be done through a legislative budget conference, um, which wouldn't require everybody to come back. Um, so once uh, there's some clarity on that situation as well, you can anticipate seeing a, a very strong push on a lot of these state infrastructure projects, which of course plays into a lot of what we're having, we're talking about right now. Um, when uh, Paul and I talked with Tori, um, understand that this is, uh, sorry, Tori is uh, the chief of staff at the, the Department of Transportation. Um, the projects that were accelerated, um, it was clear that this is the first round of accelerated projects and there will be a second and possibly a third round of accelerated projects that'll be coming. So it's important to keep an eye on that as well. Great, thanks. And then we're gonna move on. Does anybody have any questions um, regarding the recovery aspect or any executive orders or emergency orders? All right, well, we'll go back into the 2020 elections. You know, this is again, um, a very new era of elections. I mean, by this time, which most of you know, you know, two months after session happens, they're full on into election mode. Um, I'm, the, I believe that some of the candidates are just now starting to get a little bit comfortable um, starting to reach out to people. You know, August is gonna come very quickly as is November. Uh, we have the new leadership, both in the House and the Senate. We're gonna have a brand new president um, and also a brand new speaker. We'll have new committee chairs. We'll have new members. There's 18 turned out in the House. Plus, they are. There's a lot of other House members that are jumping and going to other, whether it's a constitutional officer seat or something else within their local community. So we'll have a big turnover, we think. Um, and then we also have at least six in the Senate. Um, you know, I like to mention, and I want everybody to be aware. I'm sure you are, but the Broward minority leaders um, for both the House and the Senate uh, will be Senator um, Gary Farmer and uh, a dual um, team that we'll have in the House, which is uh, Representative DeBose and Representative Evan Jenny. So we really have a great start for Broward in itself. Um, but, you know, again, we don't know where we're going to be uh, with uh, elections as they move into how normal elections usually take place. We also wanted to mention that we'll have five new delegation members as well. Uh, we've got some like uh, our, our chair of the delegation, Representative Jones is running for the Senate, but uh, he will be chair of the delegation up until November where the anticipated new chair will be Senator Thurston. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, um, you know, like I said, we'll have five new delegation members. Hopefully we'll have, hopefully Representative Jones will be in the Senate. But like I said, we'll have some um, educational uh, uh, ahead of us. We'll have to do some education. We've done a good job, I think, already um, getting a closer relationship for the MPO for the delegation, but there's going to be a continued effort. With that, Chris, do you want to add anything on the elections? No, I think um, I think you pretty much hit it. it. It's a new, well, we have a bunch of commissioners um, on here also, so you all know it's a new era and people trying to figure out how they're going to do elections this year. But also what it has done is stop some of the summer conversations. Uh, along with the elections, you have the fundraisers and that's where we get a chance to talk to some of the legislators doing some of the fundraising trips and really get a lot of our information. That has hampered us and that these events aren't going on and legislators aren't having their side meetings to start shaping the session. So it's gonna put us back a little bit as we get prepared for next year's session because of the lack of events being held around elections right now. And it's going to be, you know, hate to use the phrase, a new normal, but mm -hmm. without all that summer lead up and summer events for people to have these discussions, it's gonna slow us down a little bit going into next session. Which actually brings me to a good, well, brings us to a good point in the aspect of, you know, the relationships that we have, but we'll go into new leadership. You know, like I said, we have a brand new leadership um, with a new Senate uh -huh. president, a new um, uh, speaker, but they have identified the next Senate president after that and the next two House speakers after that, which this team has a good relationship with. But I do want to tell you, Senator Simpson is from um the uh mid area of the state polk county area and then the um incoming president after that is senator pasadomo she's uh, over from collier county and then we've got uh representative sprouls who is our incoming speaker he's from the pasco area and then we have 
Representative Renner, who's from the Jacksonville area, who is slated to become speaker after him. And then we come back down south and have a speaker in Danny Perez um, out of the Miami area, just to give you a little bit of, um, uh, you know, foresight for our communication. So we'll be working heavily with that leadership. And that's, of course, if the, if the um, election mm -hmm. cycle stays the same and the Republicans stay in power, um, that's the succession. Chris, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think that's the succession. The only place you could see any movement is in the Senate. The House numbers are as they are. So I think the House mm -hmm. succession is going to be the same. But just the Senate, um, there's, you never know what's going to happen. But there, if there's any change, it will be in the Senate uh, progression of leadership. Mm -hmm. And so we're in the process, just like Chris said, usually this time is the time where we jump in and we're meeting all the new candidates and we're doing all that. We, just to let you know, um, we are involved in virtual candidacy um, conversations. Those are going to be taking place over the summer, much like we're doing today. So feel very comfortable that we'll still have the communications. It'll just be on like the new normal. But um, we are in the process of finding out what the new leadership priorities are. I mean, clearly they've all been in the House and the Senate before, so we have an indication. But each session is different. And depending on what um, transpires over the next few months might change their direction as they go into their um, tenure. Uh, with that, Lauren, Robbie, do you have anything before we go into uh, recurring legislation, which I think Lauren will take over? Um, just that we we were expecting the the new leadership, uh, Wilton Simpson and uh, Chris Frowles, to be even more conservative than what they they are. What what our current leadership is right now. Um, and when when uh, Representative Sprouls gave his designation speech, he said that the state has a spending problem. So we already knew that he was planning on maybe whittling down the budget or, or at least uh, tampering down on spending. Um, and that was prior to our current situation. Um, so definitely if, uh, after this pandemic and then also if a hurricane hits, um, I don't think they're gonna have much of a political issue with cutting down the budget um, if they decide to go that route. Uh, but also Representative Sprouls said that climate change was a priority of his and he actually used that term um, so we're hopeful that he will be interested in investing resources into resiliency, and we're looking forward to working with him on that. And obviously that's going to um, frame a lot of uh, our advocacy efforts moving forward. Um, and, and it's uh, not saying that it's uh, impossible. It'll certainly be a challenge, but it, it's, it certainly uh, will, will guide our efforts um, moving forward with the MPO. Thank you. Lauren, do you want to touch base on a recurring legislation? I know you mentioned a few of the, obviously the transportation that'll come back and the fact that we're going to have new leadership and new committee members may change some of the focus. Um, I know that we've identified a few members that are very um, transportation oriented, such as um, Representative Fisher out of the Jacksonville area and also uh, Representative Jackie Toledo out of the Tampa area. Um, but, uh, and then of course, Senator Brandis is constantly um, really running point on transportation in the Senate, but I'll turn it over to Lauren if she wants to speak about any recurring legislation that she thinks is definitely going to be coming back or not coming back. I would, I would actually anticipate that all of the legislation that failed um, will be coming back, that we'll see that um, absolutely the FDOT packages, which will hopefully give us an opportunity to offensively pursue some of our priorities. Um, but, but I believe that we should expect to have all of that legislation back. Um, but like I said, some of the priorities may change depending on the fiscal state of the state. Sounds good. Does anybody have any questions before we move to the next slide? Nope, thank you. All right, wonderful. Lauren? Um, so next slide, sorry. No, it's okay. So we'll go right in, legislative oh, yeah. delegation. We pretty much touched base on that. Um, so the five seats, just to let everybody know, obviously is Representative Chevron Jones's seat, um, our beloved Kristen Jacobs, which we miss um, dearly. Uh, we will, she cannot be replaced, um, but I know that uh, we've got um, some big shoes to fill there and there's some good candidate. Uh, there is a great candidate that has um, stepped up for that. So uh, her seat will be um, New as will Representative um, Starks in the Weston area and also Senator Brainin, who we just talked to about that Chevron Jones is running for. And then Anna Maria Rodriguez, even though that she um, uh, is mainly Miami, she was a very active Broward delegation member. Um, she had a very, very small piece 
of Broward, but she was very active and Republican as well. So she was, um, you know, helpful when we needed to work with leadership um, on behalf of the on behalf of the delegation. Uh, so we will all those five seats will we will have new um, we will have new uh, representation in those areas. And then also again, I just want to stress the fact that we have the minority leadership in both chambers that we're going to heavily um, work with. And also the fact that we have the executive director of the Broward delegation and also the executive director for Broward Days, which has really um, been very cohesive for um, and the unity, I think, of our community and uh, had a great group again this year. I think it was the largest group that we've had in many, many, many years. And uh, I want to thank um, everybody that's been participating. I know everybody that we're talking to right now is extremely um involved and also uh, commissioner for as always you've always been very supportive at the county level and i just can't thank you enough for, for your involvement um my team does anybody have anything more on the legislative delegation um just that we we learned early on that that was a, a really key thing um that was missing in in throughout the state uh when we first were when we first joined this team almost immediately we had the proposal that was going to limit board membership and also institute term limits. And we found out that delegations across the state did not have a good relationship with their MPOs. Um, if they even knew what an MPO was. And that was something that we, we knew early on that we, we definitely needed to strengthen um, our relationship with our delegation. And we're thankful that we do have a really great relationship with our delegation and our delegation members really, um, you know, understand or at least have a basic knowledge of who we are and they're always willing to work with us. Um, so that's a really great, great asset to have. The, um, I'll, I'll chip in that with our delegation, it's kind of misunderstood sometimes that because it's a predominantly democratic delegation and a Republican Tallahassee, um, because of the seniority and mentioned numerous times of leadership in both chambers um, in the minority party, from Broward that our delegation is going to be very key and very important in these next legislative sessions. Um, the senior leadership of Jenny and DuBose in the House and with Farmer and Thurston in the Senate, the cohesive Broward delegation speaking as one voice, especially on transportation issues, will mm -hmm. be key for us um, going forward. No, absolutely. And thanks, Chris, for that. And then, you know, we might want to talk about bringing um, them in at a later date, Greg, um, maybe, you know, towards the fall or something like that to have a further conversation about their leadership thoughts. I'm um, just throwing that out there. Mm -hmm. um, but for statewide relationships, you know, we have very close contact with the Florida Association of Counties constantly. They are a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, uh, partner, as are the Florida League of Cities, very close working relationship up in Tallahassee with both of them, as is the MPO AC, Carl, has been wonderful. Uh, we've actually got Carl um, involved with FAIR, which is the Florida Association of Intergovernmental Relations, which meets once weekly um, during session to discuss uh, anything and everything that is on a local um, level <coughs> for um, whether it's MPOs, whether it's uh, transportation author authorities, whether it's cities, counties, um, really a great group uh, to be able to do that. So that collaboration, bringing them in along with the Ports Council, we've gotten them involved as well. Um, Secretary Tybalt, he's been fantastic with his um, time and his accessibility, like Robbie said. I mean, also Tori is from, um, his chief of staff is from Broward County, so we've had a long-term relationship with him as well. He's been great, but the secretary really has been wonderful. Actually, Greg and Paul, um, we were able to facilitate a meeting with the secretary during Broward days up there with the secretary um, at that time. So I'm really trying to pull all these uh, entities that we have together and all these um, accessibility points for uh, on behalf of the MPO and really um, boosting the advocacy level on the statewide level. Not only that, we were able to get um, uh, Paul and Greg a seat at the table on the EV task force for the state. Um, and we are just continuing to build those coalitions. We are also working um, in uh, collaboration. You know, there's only a few other MPOs that have state representation. Um, have good working relationships with both Orlando and Miami and um, their uh, lobbyists as well. So we will continue to do that um, as we move forward into the fall and into the next legislative session. My team have anything on that? Did I miss a partner other than, you know, the legislators? <laughs> That's kind of an important part of this conversation, um, which clearly we've got those relationships, but are working on the people that are on, um, you know, on the 
uh, forefront of coming in um, and being new or going to be new in the Senate or new in the House as well. I, can I, this is Greg. I just want to thank Candace and the t entire team because your work up in Tallahassee and, and locally has been tireless. And the fact that you've been able to leverage the other groups that we're members of, uh, like the MPOAC, which then leverages the other 26 MPOs in the state, um, has been really, really remarkable. And I just want to thank you for that. You know, from it's just been great. Every time I get with uh, Secretary T. Bow, he always talks about our meeting up in Tallahassee and the MPO offices, also known as uh, the soda machine room. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, it was, uh, you know, it's been actually a real positive experience. And, I, you know, Paul Cavarese working with y'all too has uh, just been uh, remarkable in making things move forward up in Tallahassee. So thank you for helping us with that sphere of influence. No, and thank you so much. We love working with you. And like I said at the beginning, we love the relationship. Um, so, and, and the transparency and the, and, the, and the communication really is fantastic. Um, and then, you know, going right into that with the regional collaboration, you know, obviously um, this uh, COVID pandemic has really created a situation where the four counties, mainly the three counties, but also putting Monroe in there, really has worked very um, closely together. And we're hoping that to see that continue on many different aspects, not only in the collaboration of reopening Florida, but really looking forward to um, all aspects of having that regional collaboration. So we'll continue to work with the Tri-County um, area and also, um, you know, we were supposed to have the transportation summit, uh, which clearly is, um, I don't know if it's going to be rescheduled or not, Greg, I'll put that to you, but, um, you know, lots of conversations with that. And I think the collaboration um, with that anticipation coming up, I think has been great with the business community and others. Um, do we know if that's even a thought process? Uh, one of the things I've been, you know, I did have the conversation with Dan and trying to get it back online for probably next year to share with everybody, including the board members, um, the seven largest TMA MPOs have actually also gotten together to deal with state funding and the ears that are tied to the state funding. And we're actually scheduling a meeting uh, like this um, with central office uh, planning staff. And we're gonna move it all the way up to the secretary. So uh, Candace through Paul, we're gonna keep you informed as that happens. Um, but we literally started meeting two weeks ago. All the, they wanted to call themselves the Magnificent Seven. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's the plan. And, uh, you know, because we, we, we represent basically uh, one th or two thirds of the entire population of the seven MPOs. So it's um, going to be a very interesting uh, move forward as we do that. And, you know, obviously we'll be coming back with a uh, TSE and uh, trying to figure out how we work together with our all of the state advocates that each of our entities have, because Orlando Metroplan has theirs, uh, Jeff Sheffield in Jacksonville has his, and uh, Miami Dade just hired some. I don't know mm -hmm. if you knew that Miami Dade TPO. So uh, you know we're all this is about trying to you know move the reg our regions plural forward, and really appreciate that too. And yes, we're going to do that conference. Don't know when, don't know when, but it's gonna happen. Well, and that's awesome. And thank you for that. And yeah, um, you know, like I said, we've got really great working relationships with um, the lobbyists and all the, for all of them. And we've, uh, you know, already have the experience of working with um, the Orlando guys from, you know, the first year that we were hired regarding the board um, membership. But again, you know, just to kind of close up this and we can open it up for discussion, um, but you know, like Chris mentioned, we're really going to utilize and leverage our, um, you know, having the minority leader in both the House and the Senate uh, moving into these next couple of years, but also knowing that Danny Perez is going to be coming out of Miami. He's, you know, he's going to, he's going to have some strength knowing that he's in line to be speaker, um, even if it is six years away. And then we've also got some strong members in Palm Beach County as well. And they usually work very um, collaboratively together as a delegation as a whole. So they're very strong when they set their mind to it. So we're really, as your representatives, are really going to hone in and utilize the relationships we have in those three uh, districts to make sure that our priorities are heard and, and, and vetted and have a good representation. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to my team. I've been talking more, probably more than they want me to, um, to see if they have anything to add. Um, and then we can open it up for discussion. 
Just in terms of the of the post COVID nineteen opportunities, um, I don't want to repeat what we've already said uh, with the recovery, but we do know that transportation projects are going to play a key role in the state's recovery. Um, we know that the governor uh, really likes uh, the idea of accelerating uh, the projects, um, and we we know that now is kind of the time to start influencing what infrastructure projects are given priority um, and and what are what's accelerated and and the directions that we go in uh, to shape that. We we still don't know what the impact of the pandemic will be, but we know that, you know, the the lower unemployment rate is going to be lower ridership in our public transit. Um, and we we know that things are going to have to change in terms of, you know, the, the airports are going to have to um, reduce the touch points and the seaport seaports and and also our, our public transit agencies. Um, and SFRTA, they're, they're going to have to reduce touch points and uh, reduce crowding, change how all that's going to look. Um, but we are constantly monitoring all of the discussions. Um, we're, we're talking to the, the decision makers and um, we are ready to seize whatever opportunities that come along um, in order to help shape that. All right. Well, with that, Robbie, do you have anything? I you know Chris had to drop off. Um, I was happy that he was able to join us for at least a little while. And then we'll turn it back over to you, Greg or Paul, to kind of either bring us in for a landing or does anybody have any questions or want to talk about anything that we've covered? I think there, I think that's about it from from our end. Um, you know, we'll continue to work with the with the team. Um, excited because really this is the the, these infrastructure projects are the path forward for the state to economic recovery. Um, and so we're excited to um, be a part of the conversation with you all. Mm. And this has been, this I wanted to thank Ms. Jackson. I really enjoy those reports that I get and uh, she's always made herself available whenever I've had a question. Thanks. It's actually a team effort too. Uh, with Robbie takes a lot of the notes as well. So, so. <laughs> thank you. Mm. And then we and then we send them out to everybody. So thank you for that too, because it's just like it's great. It's great being able. To, it's been interesting to get the responses back on the COVID updates from some of the TSE or some of the member governments that aren't part of the TSE umbrella, and uh, that that are you know grabbing it through the MPO, and it's been um, it's been great. So keep up with the great work and. Uh, you know, it also helps us when we ask for the local contribution, um, you know, because this is, uh, they see the value in it. Wonderful, thank you. And, we'll, and, and also as, as those reports come out, um, you know, make sure that the membership knows they can reach out to us directly um, if they have any questions or if they want any additional information. And, you know, a lot of those things, they're, they're, you know, sometimes an hour and a half long, some of these press conferences and they don't get every single thing we're trying to get the gist of it. But if there's anything that anybody wants, you know, please make sure that they can reach out to us directly. Or if there's mm -hmm. anything you particularly want us to keep an eye on as well, that's of interest, we're, we're happy to keep an extra ear out for that. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. I'm ready to bring you in for a landing. It doesn't sound like, uh, Mr. Chair, do you want to ask if there's any uh, member, any more member questions? If not, uh, we can let TSE go and continue doing their great work and uh, move on to the next subject. All right, thank you, team. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on. Uh, what I'm going to do is exercise chair privilege here um, and move on to agenda item six because it's 1130 and I need my board to see the next agenda and ha have an opportunity to ask questions. So I'm gonna put four and five in abeyance at this time uh, and go on to item six, which is gonna be the discussion of May 14th MPO agenda. <laughs> I was on mute. Um, so basically, we're going to talk about this. Uh, this entire meeting will be using the Zoom platform, so we won't have any uh, physical presence in the office. Um, this is actually going very well today, so hopefully we can have a repeat performance next Thursday. Uh, you know, we have the typical items up front, which is the pledge, which we're going to do. Um, electronic roll call, which uh, Rebecca is going to move through. Uh, approval of the minutes and then public comments and approval of absences. Um, under consent items, we have both the evaluations, mine and the executive director, as well as the approval of another interlocal agreement between Broward MPO 
and the city of Wilton Manors for transportation planning services. It was the, um, and, and, and sadly, um, this was the agreement signed by Justin, yeah. Mayor Justin Flippin. I did not have printed it out because I, I got caught up. You want to come up here? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Uh -huh. My cat's talking to me. Okay. Uh -huh. But uh, so Justin Mayor, Mayor Flippin, uh, before he passed away, this is probably one of the last documents that he signed. Um, so basically, we have that as a final consent item with Wilton Manners. Then in action items, we have a TIP amendment, and this is for both Commercial Boulevard uh, north of Cypress Creek, it's the 95 and improvements. This ties to actually the mobility hub uh, that ties to our tri-rail station where our office building is located. So it's improvements to the roadway to the, on the west side of the building that ties to the tri-rail station, as well as the roadway in front of our building that ties over to the park and ride lot that is at, uh, five, at 95 by Cypress Creek. And then it also ties into improvements on Cypress Creek Boulevard. Uh, we have uh, transportation performance measures consensus planning document. This is uh, a document that the Federal Highway Administration uh, requested that we put into our uh, transportation improvement plan. However, now they've asked us to actually just adopt the document once and not put it into the TIP. So we've already actually visited this performance standard, but this is uh, you know, basically the, uh, re the reconfirming that conversation. Um, then we have two motions, and this is Mr. Stewart. or three. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to action item one, I know that there's the amendment for the TIP, um, but uh, based on our uh, Mr. Stewart and I, along with um, I believe it was um, Mrs. Cassini, met with uh, District Secretary Jerry O'Reilly and Steve Braun. Uh, through yeah. a Zoom meeting, and I believe that uh, we are to anticipate that there's going to be a motion from Weston uh, to also amend the tip to exclude the park and ride element of the oh. Royal Palm okay. and 75 intersection. Um, this, from what, it, what we had the conversation with Weston, the latest I had with, uh, this is a public forum, so I can discuss it, with Commissioner Jaffe is he was going to wait until the June meeting to do that as part of the TIP adoption. So- right. You're right, I, yeah. that's my mistake, thank you. No, no worries. Um, so then the final item is three, and this is the MPO budget. This is a two-year budget. We've been meeting with Federal Highway Administration and Central Office of, in DOT in Tallahassee, as well as the district office here in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, well, this is pretty much a final draft, it's still drafty, and I, you know, I know that sometimes people don't understand necessarily why this is because the final budget numbers aren't issued by the state of Florida. The final budget numbers aren't issued by the federal government. Um, so we have a lot of things that will probably, they're not huge, but there might be some shifting back and forth. Um, that's what this uh, motion A will be moving forward with adopting at least the, the, the budget as we've proposed. It's gonna be authorizing myself and the chair as well as the general counsel to execute other documents um, that may need to happen in between. You obviously, the board will see that again um, through the administrative process, you'll see any changes, but anything that has to do with numbers or uh, actual final numbers, the board will actually see. And then finally, it's the merit policy for next two years. Um, and based on our estimated budget, we're gonna we're still recommending we leave it as a three percent across the board for staff members, including myself. And anything above that would be, um, and we budget up to five percent, would be a one-time bonus. And with that, um, that that is the uh, the action items. Uh, any questions on any of those? Okay, hearing none. Um, comments from the chair. Uh, basically, the chair will probably talk about the actions that we've taken during this COVID emergency. Member comments. We obviously will be receiving comments should there be some comments from the chair or from the members. I will be providing some updates on both legislative through Paul Caparizzi, as well as the MPO, just to share with you, won a statewide award uh, last week or the week before last. 
Uh, among the 27 MPOs, we were nominated and won on our Complete Streets Master Plan Program. Uh, they sent us a trophy, but it had it went back to Tallahassee because there's no one at the office to receive it. Uh, so I will eventually take pictures of it when we do receive it and share it with the organization or with everybody on the board, as well as shamelessly promote it on social media. Um, then finally, the general counsel will give his report, which there's a lot going on. The general counsel has been extremely busy, as everyone can tell. And then finally, the non-action items. And this is going to be something I think that if the members stay online will be fascinating for them. Our performance measures dashboard, there is a site on the MPO that basically website that provides a breakdown for crash data, demographics, um, of all of our municipal governments, and then also at the county-wide level. That's uh, really, uh, it's again going to be one of those national best practices that we're going to uh, You look at the multimodal priorities list. This is a draft. This is an opportunity for the board members to comment on that before it goes forward at the June meeting. And then finally, the uh, Department of Transportation would like to provide us an update on their 20, uh, their Florida transportation plan uh, and where they are with that. We've asked them to do an abbreviated version uh, because there's a lot of detail that could happen within that. Our financial reports, you get the uh, basically the UPWP, any amendments with that, notifications on local contribution as well as our contract summary report with all the contracts we have going. Um, April, April and May correspondence are probably going to be very rich given the conversations we've been having uh, back and forth with Washington as well as internally. And then uh, the Technical Advisory Committee actions and recommendations. I want to let everybody know that the TAC and CAC have been also operating virtually via Zoom. And the attendance uh, of those meetings are through the roof. Uh, the TAC and Mike, you can correct me on this, but I believe there was about 81, maybe more attendees at the TAC, or at the TAC meeting and a significant amount at the uh, CAC. This is consistent with uh, the MPOs around the nation. Delaware Valley, which is Philadelphia area, has seen a giant increase in public participation via these, uh, these type of Zoom conferences that use the same platform as well. So uh, that covers the uh, June 11th meeting. A any questions? Well, I was just going to say that under my comments, one of the other things that I was going to do is, uh, sorry, my dog, <laughs> he's sick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, is to thank the entities that have contributed their uh, local contribution. And as of um, the report that's online right now, that would be the school board. So thank you, Mrs. Good, uh, City of Fort Lauderdale, the city of Hollywood, thank you, Mr. Blattner, uh, city of Miramar, city of Coral Springs, city of Pompano Beach, Davie, pat myself on the back. <laughs> uh, we've got city of Sunrise, city of Weston, city of Margate, Coconut Creek, Oakland Park, Cooper City, Parkland, West Park, Lighthouse Point, yay, Johnson. <laughs> um, Lauderdale by the Sea and Hillsborough Beach. So not to pick on the county. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, we weren't, we weren't I going saw there. that yesterday. Okay. Yeah, we're we're yeah. thanking those who contributed. Because otherwise we're going to have to beat up Lazy Lakes. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I contribute the $2 for Lazy Lakes. That's coming so out of You're a mind. deadbeat right now because it's still I, 10. I know. I, I, I need to physically give them $2. Well, the, the finance team and I haven't been I haven't seen them for 35 days now so and just so you know at the last um, uh, ethics training that I received the whole commission for Lady Lakes was there and I told them they were deadbeats and they said they didn't <laughs> care quote we want nothing to do with the MPO unquote <laughs> <laughs> well they don't want anything but pay in fact I don't even think they want to repave their street Okay, are there any questions from the membership about the upcoming agenda? Uh, Chair Kaleka, we have a hand raised in the attendees. Okay. 
Can you point that out for us? Uh, yes, we have Lovita Baker. I can allow her to talk if you wish, Chair. Sure, because I don't seem to have that option. <sighs> uh, Lovita Baker, your hand is raised and you can unmute yourself now. Thank you. Um, I'm actually just trying to get access to be made the captioner in the meeting. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> All right, give me a moment. I didn't realize our captioner was changing. <laughs> All right, you can continue, Chair. Okay, so uh, seeing no more uh, interested individuals, we will go back to uh, item number four. I believe uh, Mr. Gies has a presentation for us. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, let me bring up the presentation here in just a moment. Hold on. Right. Can everybody see the presentation here? Yes. Okay, great. So again, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Executive Committee, Peter Gee, Systems Planning Manager for the Broward MPO. Uh, this has been an item that has been long time coming uh, as part of the strategic business plan. Uh, and we really wanted to update the Executive Committee membership on the Reasonable Progress Program, kind of give a description of what the Reasonable Progress Program is, uh, and also get some feedback from the Executive Committee before uh, we proceed any further and also bring this item to the board. So this is not an item that is going to the board just yet. Uh, we're keeping at the executive committee level. Uh, again, we're looking for your leadership and guidance on uh, some of the progress that we've made and some questions that we have moving forward with this program. So uh, let me see if I can get this to proceed. There we go. So what is reasonable progress? Um, we define reasonable progress uh, as the time it takes for um, that projects progress reasonably through, and I'm sorry, I am, there we go, as the timely advancement of transportation projects from planning to implementation. And now that's a very uh, key statement because we're actually looking at the entire process all the way from when a project is conceived to construction. Typically, when you look at reasonable progress uh, from a project perspective, you're focusing on the last piece, the construction piece, and making sure that the project is being delivered well, being delivered efficiently. But from the MPO's perspective as a funding agency, we want to make sure that projects are being identified well, are moving through the planning process, are getting the things that they need to, uh, to meet the programming requirements so they can get funding, and that they progress efficiently through the design and construction process. And again, when I go back to this being a long time coming, this uh, looking at reasonable progress at an entire process perspective from planning to construction has really uh, forced us to take a step back and look at how we measure reasonable progress. So some of the uh, history behind reasonable progress, uh, this was first identified in the strategic business plan in 2015, as you can see here as goal number two, we wanted to hold agencies receiving federal funding accountable. Now in the era of performance management and making sure that we are doing everything that we can to monitor projects and make sure that they are being delivered efficiently, this was uh, a concurrent goal that just made sense in the strategic business plan. Again, we reaffirmed that commitment in 2017 as part of the strategic business plan, where we also wanted to identify owners and operators who consistently deliver projects on time and on budget. Uh, so this was a way to make sure that funding that was being allocated through the MPO in the transportation improvement program was going to projects that were ultimately being delivered and providing a benefit to the community. And as you all know, anytime we deliver a project here at the MPO, it's not just a one person process. This is typically a multiple partner process where we have implementers, uh, we have project sponsors who are all helping to move the project forward. And we are all aware that sometimes um, that partnership uh, you know, deteriorates or there's an issue uh, with one of the partners in moving the project forward. And sometimes we end up spending a lot of money on a project for it just to die. And we wanna try and be proactive here and make sure that we identify those issues early on. And we also know when to cut ties with a project. So again, this, is, this came up through a multitude of different projects um, historically. And we really wanted to make sure that we had a, a codified process to how to deal with projects that um, are not progressing efficiently, but also reward those partners who are helping us deliver projects and spending our funds wisely. 
So how do you measure reasonable progress? This was something, again, that I mentioned early on was we were really struggling with because typically this is something that is done during the construction phase. Uh, you make sure that a project is being delivered well, that all the elements are being constructed, uh, that it's being done on time, there's a schedule that needs to be followed and it's very cut and dry. Uh, what we did initially is we took a very simplistic approach and said, well, the way you measure reasonable progress is you follow the money. You make sure that the money is being expended and it's being expended in the reasonable times, it's not being delayed. Uh, and we can do that easily through the transportation improvement program. So we thought. Uh, when we got into it with our consultant, uh, we started taking the money that was in the transportation improvement program and trying to see if we could take when funds were allocated for a project and make sure that it was uh, following a process where design, fundings were, design funding was being identified for the project and that ultimately construction funding was being identified. And that would then be a check for us to say, yes, this project uh, met its deadlines, progressed reasonably and utilized all the funding that was assigned and that the cost didn't go up or down um, without any good explanation. Well, in Florida, it is a little bit difficult because we do have the Florida Department of Transportation as sort of a middleman between our, our federal funding and us. Uh, and when you actually start to track the funds, you find that the funding moves around for various reasons. And it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily attributed to anything that one of the project sponsors or implementers does. It's just sometimes how things work. So sometimes design comes two years out from a project. Sometimes design comes three years out from a project. Sometimes construction comes three years from design because there's right of way that's required. And we found that there was no consistent way for us to take the funding and track the funding as a way to measure reasonable progress. So we kind of had to go back to the drawing board and we started with one of our other work products, which was the transportation planning guidebook. And the reason why we started with the transportation planning guidebook is that is way at the beginning of the process when you are uh, coming up with an idea for a project. And what the transportation planning guidebook established were four key elements that a project needed in order to move forward through the programming project. And that was scope of work, cost estimate, partner collaboration, and resolution. And when the team took a step back and said, yeah, we can actually take all four of these elements and apply them to a project through all elements or through all the, the steps in the process, mm -hmm. from planning to programming, to funding, to design, to construction. And if any one of these elements were to ever change throughout that process, that would let us know that we have an issue and we are not uh, proceeding forward with, reason with reasonable progress. So a bit more detail on who is involved in reasonable progress. We have to identify the parties. So here's some definitions for you. A project sponsor is someone who proposes a project for MPO funding. This is typically a municipality, someone who comes forward and puts in a C-slip application or someone who has a project identified in one of our plans, a complete streets master plan, maybe the mobility hub. That is who a project sponsor is. A project provider is someone who uses MPO funds to design and construct a project. This could typically be the Florida Department of Transportation, or in the case of sometimes where we do a local agency program or LAP agreements, it may be the city itself. So in this case, both the project sponsor and the project provider could be the same, but oftentimes they are different. Finally, a right-of-way owner is someone who has jurisdictional ownership or property rights to the land or facility within the project limits of the scope. Again, this could be someone who, maybe who's private property, or it could be a county-owned uh, facility where a city is proposing a project. Uh, so in, in line with what I was just saying, sometimes a project sponsor, provider, and right-of-way owner can all be the same. It could be a city where a city sponsored the project, they're delivering the project through the local agency program, and they also own the right-of-way within uh, the, the project. But sometimes all three uh, can be different, where it's a project sponsor as a city, project provider as a Florida Department of Transportation, and a right-of-way owner where it may be uh, the county on one of their roads. So we wanted to make sure that we were providing that distinction because all three of these entities play a unique role in the delivery of a project. And it's not necessarily uh, sometimes up to the project sponsor to make sure that the project moves forward. We need to make sure that the project provider and right-of-way owner are also making sure that the project is moving forward well. So if the right-of-way owner all of a sudden causes problems, let's say on verifying right-of-way, then it's not the project sponsor's fault that the right-of-way owner could not verify right-of-way. And then in that case, the right-of-way owner is the one who's inhibiting reasonable progress in this case. Some other reasonable progress terms that we identified is a project in trouble, which is identified as a project that's unable to achieve its next reasonable progress milestone, 
or it lost one of those four criteria during the project delivery process. So we wanted a way to be able to identify when a project was in trouble, meaning, meaning that it was not meeting those reasonable progress terms. A limited provider is a project sponsor or provider that demonstrates a history of pattern or pattern of projects in trouble. So as I was mentioning before, uh, a provider could be one, a sponsor, could be um, a, a, uh, a provider or could also be a right of way owner. And if they are consistently uh, producing roadblocks to, uh, to, to meet reasonable progress, we wanna make sure that we have a way to call those folks out. And you can see on the right hand side, I, I added some elements uh, that are typically risk to reasonable progress where there's incorrect cost estimates, uh, you have change in governing body support, there's a change in public support, um, or there's insufficient or changing scope details. And this is just a, a sample of what typically goes wrong when you get to a project in trouble and it has impacted reasonable progress. So I wanted to, to uh, pose a few examples of how reasonable progress would be applied in the context of some projects that we've dealt with here at the MPO. Uh, the first one being the Elmar Greenway, which was a project funded uh, through uh, the MPO in 2015 as part of a mo mobility program. The project sponsor provided resolutions of support both in 2015 for programming and 2017 for design. And the project was programmed for design and construction in those subsequent years. So this project was well on its way to being delivered. However, we ran into an issue with the project sponsor where, uh, in this case, uh, the, the town, where they revised the project scope in 2019 and revised it to the point where we could no longer accommodate it under the existing design and under the terms under which the, the project was originally programmed. So they ultimately rescinded their resolution of support. So you can see in this case, uh, the scope of work and the resolution were both changed and this now was a project in trouble. And unfortunately here, we'd spent money on design and the project ended up having to be canceled uh, because those two elements of uh, the project readiness were no longer met. Uh, again, scope of work and resolution having been rescinded here in this case. The next project is the Wave Streetcar. Uh, this is obviously a big example where many partners were involved. Uh, and you can see in the first bullet point, it, the project cost was uh, upwards of $190 million with a partnership between the city of Fort Lauderdale, the DDA, Broward County Transit, South Florida Regional Transportation Authority, FDOT, and the Broward MPO. And throughout the process, um, I'm not going to belabor it because I know we all have PTSD still from this project, but uh, scope changes, cost increases, and ultimately local support impacted the project. So the project had to be canceled in May 2018 because there was no longer an agreement on the scope of work. The cost estimate had gone up uh, beyond what was initially thought of uh, as part of the FTA Small Starts funding and all of the funding commitments provided by the partners. And then a resolution of support was uh, uh, rescinded by the city of Fort Lauderdale because they no longer wanted to move forward with the project. So this again was another case where we lost three out of the four program ready elements uh, with the Wave Streetcar. The final example that I wanted to pose was uh, the fair interoperability uh, uh, project that we're working on with Broward County Transit. This is more of a planning project, so it's not necessarily a construction project, where we began in 2014 with Broward County Transit um, to uh, move forward towards fair interoperability where we could have a single payment and single fare card system between the different transportation systems in the region. Uh, there was FTA obligated funding in the amount of $3.7 million. And uh, we've encountered significant procurement delays. There's been a scope change and some of the regional partners, not necessarily Broward County Transit, but the other partners had withdrawn from the process. So the project still has yet to achieve its goals and we're headed for a third contract extension. So once again, here you can see three out of the four program ready elements are not met at this point in time. Uh, and I would say this is a project that qualifies as a project in trouble based on the previous definition. So wrapping up the, uh, the reasonable progress program, one of the things that we want to do is we want to start applying the reasonable progress program to the projects that we are funding through the transportation improvement program using, using both state and uh, federal funds and have an annual state of the providers report where we identify the partners who are delivering projects well and maybe some of the limited providers who are not necessarily delivering projects well uh, and what actions we are gonna take in that. 
In addition, we also want to uh, continue publishing a state of the system report where we can show what impact the projects are having in the region, um, how well we are delivering, the, delivering those projects, how we're adding to the bicycle lane network, how we make sure that we're uh, reducing congestion in the system. And that's something that we also want to publish annually alongside the state of the providers report. So the question for the executive committee, uh, and I'm ending on this last slide, is something that we of staff have been talking about as it re relates to the application of the reasonable progress policy. So we want to identify near-term corrective actions for projects in trouble, uh, take a proactive approach to ensure successes or avoid losses. We're often at a point with a project where we know that there's a project in trouble, we've identified it, but we're not exactly sure how we need to uh, get the project back on track or just at what point do we cut ties to avoid large losses. And I think this is something that we want to develop both uh, with the board, the executive committee and staff, which includes something like a, a performance action plan where once we've identified a project in trouble, we would like to work with the provider or sponsor right of way owner that is um, uh, holding up the project and coming up with a course of action to get the project back on track within a reasonable amount of time. If that doesn't happen, the project is canceled. And again, this is just as an example, we're looking for guidance from the executive committee on this one. Also looking ahead to project scoring for MPO funding programs for limited providers. If we identify certain limited providers, should that impact project scoring in things like the Complete Streets and Localized Initiative program, or let's say in the new Mobility Hubs program, if we know that you're a limited provider and you've had issues delivering projects in the past, should we then make sure that either has um, a zero, uh, meaning you receive zero points in the score or even negative points uh, as part of the scoring criteria for these funding programs? And finally, do we want to go as far as to impact funding availability for those uh, entities that are uh, labeled as limited providers? Do we then preclude them from funding in the future uh, if we've identified that they are not successful at delivering projects and they have um, shown uh, to be roadblocks in making sure that we are delivering projects all the way through from planning to construction? So I appreciate the, the time that you've been able to give us here. I think this is an exciting uh, program that we've set up at the Broward MPO. And I really uh, look forward to seeing how this impacts the delivery of our projects. And hopefully we can get some more success and make sure that we uh, cut our losses uh, when we know projects are headed down the wrong path. So Mr. Chair, uh, I'll turn it back over to you uh, and uh, welcome any questions. Okay, the only comment that I have um, so far, as far as how do we handle um, when there are substantial roadblocks, the one thing I don't wanna do is cut their possibility of funding or give them lower rankings because they made a mistake. Um, I really think that it should be on a case by case basis. And if there was somebody who let's say after 10 submissions failed 10 times in a row, bring it to the attention. Um, I think it'd be better to educate them from our staff rather than to possibly uh, impact their funding. I think that's a great point. And to, to, exactly as you said, there's, some, there's kind of like a spectrum, right, of how limited a provider is. And we want to acknowledge that if there was a simple mistake made, we don't necessarily want to penalize them to the full extent either. Yeah, and this is Greg, just to, to build on that, it's you, you, you start noticing trends and one mistake is a mistake. Second mistake, well, you know, maybe there was an issue there. Third mistake, then you start going, well, you know, we have a pattern of problems that are occurring. And that's why this whole reasonable project product report and just looking at how things are going kind of builds the all right, well, maybe you do have an issue or maybe they don't have an issue and there's been a series of unfortunate incidents that have happened. And so, but that needs to, there needs to be a tracking mechanism for that, for us to be able to, you know, understand the investment of federal dollars. Because just on, on the Wave Streetcar alone, our agency was out, you know, what was it, $8 million, I think, or six, somewhere in there. And we'll never recover that again. And $6 million would have gone really far elsewhere. No, I understand that, but there was also a change in leadership in the Fort Lauderdale Commission where they turned over four of the five commissioners and 
you can't penalize them for having, you know, because who's right, the first commission or the second commission? And the answer oh, is they're, they're yeah, representing yeah. their constituency. I'd hate to have that on their record just because they had a leadership change. That's just one factor. I mean, there was other factors in that project too that, that happened. I was, that's, I was there too, but <laughs> the end result I, it got canceled and, and uh, they were echoing uh, the oh. feelings constituency and I can't blame them for that. I've been wrong on things before. And, and well, one, of, one of the other things we talked to Mr. Chair, what we talked to DOT about, because like, I'm going to use Elmar as an example, because that got way down the pike too. Um, just like the wave did and designs were done and monies, our monies were utilized to do a lot of the engineering work for both of those projects. Um, in my conversations with Steve Brown and Jerry O'Reilly is when the DOT provides the funds to the local government it doesn't, whatever the member may be, uh, county or city, um, or even the school board, it would come with, all right, if you choose to cancel out on this thing, there's some cost recovery that would happen to come back, where it's not a, well, now we want even more stuff. You know, there, there needs to be some understanding because then people will constantly be throwing the federal dollars like has been happening out the window. So, I mean, I'm not trying, we're not trying to, you know, penalize, but it's just how do you follow these things and figure out where the money's being spent and where it's being spent appropriately. I mean, it was a, it's a performance issue in some cases. Yes, but anytime you have a waste of dollars, you need to have some kind of documentation. I think the documentation here would be, did the MPO staff reach out to <laughs> government agency? Did they reach out to their elected officials to say, we gave them all of the information that they needed so that they could make their decision. Yeah, and in, in the Waves case, we, we really did reach out to Fort Lauderdale quite a bit. But Mr. Just, Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, I love this. Uh, something that you and I talked about, Greg, a long time ago. Um, maybe I missed it, but uh, you do you have parameters, Peter, to determine how long it should take in any one of those categories that you established? That's my first question. And the second question is really a point. And I think that the information needs to be uh, shared with the sponsor on an annual basis so that they can, they can tell their constituents that the reason this project is on time or not on time are the following reasons. So uh, Chair Meredith Spotner, uh, to your first question about, you know, what are the thresholds or what are the timeframes? The nice thing about the way we set this up by uh, tying it back to the program ready criteria is that those four criteria have to be met before a project is even programmed. So if there's an impact to any one of those four criteria at any point throughout the process, it should flag as a project in trouble. If a uh, city begins to <sighs> state that they are no longer in support of the project, they lose the resolution of support, that is a project in trouble. If they change <coughs> the scope and it impacts the cost estimate, that becomes a project in trouble. I think to your point and to the chair's point as well, is we wanna make sure that we have the appropriate documentation to show that we are working with the city and that's why I was suggesting something like a performance action plan where we've noted, hey, on this date, we uh, received communication from you that, this, that you would like the scope changed. It is at this point in the design process, we are 60% designed, we can no longer accommodate the scope change. Let's figure out how we come to conclusion on this and then use that as a process to help um, back us up with the documentation and set a timeline for solving the issue. If the issue can't be solved, we cancel the project, but at least then we've had an action plan in place to show that we tried to do something. Terrific, thank you. Any other input from the membership? Well, you received very little <laughs> direction to move forward, but <laughs> I think the summary is, is have checkpoints and documentation and not to be punitive. And, and Mr. Chair, if I may just quickly, I, I think the feedback was actually very helpful because the idea that we want to get to the point where we are impacting scoring and funding is really something where we said, what's the threshold here? Is this how far we want to go? And I think developing the performance action plan, getting a history of the application of this plan and seeing if there is a possibility where we can determine 
that it impacts funding, then maybe we need to have another conversation. But I think at this point, the direction that I feel like we have is to go ahead, produce that action plan, and let's try and first help our cities and then come up with a process to see, and if it's even warranted, um, to impact, uh, to go as far as impacting funding and points. Great, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to discussion number five. This was uh, the request of uh, Michael Karen of Oakland Park. He wanted to have a surtex, um, like I guess a summary of, of collection to the process that the MPO goes through to, through to um, FDOT, as well as the oversight board and then the county commission. Um, given that uh, there's still uncertainty with the relationship with the MPO, and I didn't really want to do a, a, a virtual uh, workshop, um, my suggestion uh, to the executive board would be just to boot this to potentially July, unless it's moot. Any thoughts? I'm sorry, say that again, please. So this is the workshop that we were going to have actually in April, mm -hmm. um, but that meeting was canceled and it was the uh, surtax workshop. It was gonna be a comprehensive workshop of everything from the collection of the surtax to how right. it goes through the process. And this was brought up by uh, board member Karn. Um, so we have to discuss, we're gonna have this workshop, but given the possibility we may not be associated with the county any longer, I would suggest move it to July unless it was moved. Okay. I think that's perfect guidance. Okay, that's what we were there. looking for. Any other members of the executive board agree or disagree? I agree with you. Okay. I'm fine. All right, there you go. It's uh, unanimous. Uh, <laughs> five zero. Uh, next is review and discussion of future agendas. Do we have anything that's potentially on the June that we have to discuss at this point? We have not had any items asked to be placed on any of the agendas by any of the board members. Um, so everything is uh, going smoothly. The Jerry Grazioso uh, amendment process is working exactly as <laughs> Okay, so next is the non-agenda. Um, any items uh, that the board members have for non-agenda? I mean, we don't, we actually don't right now, other than um, I can tell you from the staffing side, it's just how, how we go into the offices and what our, what our organization is gonna look like. And I'll be briefing you all on that as uh, we seek guidance. Um, I am remiss in letting you all know too that we finally did have a COVID case in the office building. Um, Alan, thank you for reminding me. You're welcome. And uh, yeah, and uh, that person was obviously um, you know sent home, um, and the building was cleaned again. And uh, luckily for us, no one was there. And uh, you know, so we've also asked staff not to even go visit the office or pick up anything at the office for a 15 day gestation period. So um, that's that's where we are with that. Um, you know, it was only a matter of time, unfortunately, but uh, you know, that's that's where we are. I do believe those same employees go over to Alan's building. So, <laughs> so Alan is very fortunate not to be able, not be going to the same building and standing in an elevator. Um, I can tell you from the people that have gone to the building um, the elevators are, you know, desolate. The building is desolate. So it's not a lot of activity in our building. And we are working with the building management once, you know, we can start reoccupying the space, you know, on limiting people in elevators and how it, the elevators get cleaned and even down to not pushing buttons with, uh, you know, so the elevator will just go to the floor it needs to go to, uh, you know, to increase safety for um, the folks in the building including our employees, as well as you all, as uh, you attend meetings when we finally reopen. Let's hope we get a vaccine. Um, I'd like to comment, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am, ma you're recognized. Thank you. I just don't wanna uh, really thank uh, Mr. Stewart and the, um, really <sighs> the tremendous amount of information and updates that uh, they provide um, as 
as it relates to the governor conferences and uh, it really, I know it's information beyond MPO, but it is, um, as an elected official, it is extremely helpful. And um, so I just, I, I appreciate that contact even while we're uh, you know, physically apart from all of, uh, you know, from each other. I just, I just wanted to thank him for all that. Well, thank you, it's a team effort. It's myself and Paul, as well as TSC and Holland and Knight. So it's all of us trying to put things together. I can tell you, just a, a, of interesting note, is central office staff in Tallahassee as well as Federal Highway. Also, I send it to them, and they've been utilizing it as well. <laughs> so, I mean, they, it's pretty cool. And yes, I'm, it is. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the last, uh, the last thing I wanted to discuss with you all um, before we adjourn this meeting is our June, whether we hold it in person, partially virtually, or all virtual, uh, June is the time when um, we elect our officers for the next year. And uh, I uh, have really enjoyed my time as chair and I appreciate your support. Um, this is also a team effort and you all uh, have made the organization much better uh, through your insight and your wisdom. Um, I just wanted to make sure, uh, because after I'm going to announce at the general board meeting next Thursday, uh, the elections and anybody that wants to be nominated for the a position on the executive board, we are going to have a nomination process where you accept the nomination uh, and then you will be placed on a list that will be full board membership, uh, much like our reviews were coming in, it'll be updated so that way uh, you can see real time who's running for what position. Uh, the only question I'm gonna have from each of you is uh, if you're interested in serving on the executive board again, so I can make that preemptive nomination right after the next board meeting. You, uh, County Representative Fur, are you interested in reappointment? I'm a glutton for punishment, yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Johnson, are you uh, still interested in serving on the executive board? Yes, I am. Um, Mrs. Good, are you still interested as well? Absolutely. I just want to backdrop like Commissioner Furs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> job. So you signed up for it. <laughs> and uh, uh, Chair Blattner, are you still interested in uh, representing as the uh, former chair? Sure. Okay, so my big news announcement I'm making is, is that uh, I am going to be uh, not running again for chair. So presumptively, if uh, Ortis uh, wants to move up, so it'd be like Ortis would be for chair, this is good would be vice chair. Um, chair position would be open and- uh, what? So. You should have said that first <laughs> before well, you asked everybody. That was not cool. The reason why I asked that is because um, Mayor Ortis is not here. And if for some reason he doesn't want to be chair of the nomination, then obviously that would be- Say that again, because we I couldn't hear you. Okay. Sure. So if, since uh, Frank is not here, if Frank, for whatever reason, did not want to be chair, then it would be incumbent on, I would then ask if you wanted to be chair, like to just leapfrog over uh, if he didn't want it, but he's not here, but we will reach out to him. So that way we can see uh, who's gonna be nominated as chair, vice chair, deputy chair, and all the spots. Okay. Um, just, um, I really thought you were, I thought you've done a tremendous job. I didn't, I didn't know, um, Again, I don't know your reasons for do, not participating again, but I, I think you've done a tremendous job in leading this group. Uh, and I really wish uh, that you would do it again. Is there is there a prohibition from you doing it again? For uh, No, there's not. But um, I know uh, if it is Mayor Ortis, you know, he uh, is the mayor, so he chairs his meeting. Uh, his leadership skills are great. Um, the five of you, the four others of you, are fantastic. So, you know, I consider myself the weak link of the bunch and oh, uh, I, we're gonna be just fine uh, as we figure out who's gonna be the leadership for next year. Um, I have the great respect for all four of you and and uh, I'm confident we're in good hands with Mr. Stewart. Okay. Could we vote to not accept your decision? 
<laughs> I second that. <laughs> so, uh, Brian. Yes, sir. I, I, too, think you've done a really terrific job, even yeah. though this is the longest executive committee meeting in the history of this organization. <laughs> uh, but I want to make sure I understood you. You said you were going to ask all of the members if they wanted to uh, assume a leadership role. Did I understand that correctly? Well, I asked uh, each of the members that are present if they're wanting to be on the executive board again. So we could make, so like you represent uh, the former chair position. You're actually the only one that will be around besides myself to be former chair, but it's going to be you because I'm not going to go for it. Um, and like with County Representative Furr, he will be nominated again for his position. It'll just be a question of who gets nominated for chair, vice chair, but generally speaking, we do it successively. So since Frank is the deputy, the vice chair, he would be nominated for chair if he's interested in the position. Okay, just final question. If mm -hmm. somebody wants to make a nomination from the floor, will you honor that request? Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I was planning on actually holding the elections and uh, some of them usually go by pretty easy. Like for instance, the position, if Frank wants it and he accepts the nomination, I think it'll be unanimous that he will become chair because he's vice chair. It's a natural successive of things. Um, and then there, you know, if it is, if hypothetically, if it is, you know, Ortis and then good as vice chair, um, you know, somebody's going to run for deputy vice chair, and it may be one of you all. Um, and so, but those, we're going to take them one by one. So that way uh, we do, you know, the chair's election, then vice chair, deputy vice chair, we'll do the county, small cities, and all floor nominations will be uh, accepted. So Brian, you're not going to be on the executive board at all anymore then? Uh, no, I've been on the MPO for 16 years. I know, but we need you. I appreciate that. That's very kind of everybody. Um, <laughs> I agree with her. <laughs> well, you thank you. All the knowledge. <laughs> well, I'm I not mean, gonna. I'm not going. I'm not dying. Hopefully. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. Anything else from anybody? Uh, other membership members. Yes, so um, will uh, the executive director then be reaching out to uh, Mayor Ortis to, to advise him of what just transpired? So yes, obviously yeah. we, we can't do it, so somebody else will have to. Yeah, I, I will talk with the mayor this afternoon. And we just might have to um, limit his discussions with regard to Pembroke Pines in some <laughs> 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 Wait, is, look, there's no conflict. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else? Thank right. you. Thank you. It's 1220 and I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody.